Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Thank you all for joining me this evening. I'm so glad that you have joined us all here on Late Night with Lisa and Friends. What's the date today? I've been meaning to do this, to add this to the broadcast, and I get brain freezes. It's April 3rd, 2021. That way I get a date stamp in there in the audio. How is everyone doing this evening? I see. Let me give a shout out to a couple of people here. Nicholas Hanton, thank you for joining us. Sue Chan, I see you again, girl. Haven't seen you in a little while. Glad to see you back in the chat here. Joshua, good to see you. I think you're a relative newcomer. Welcome. And I know there's people that are watching that are not in the chat. Sister Victoria, shout out. I know you're listening. I know you don't feel where we're going to pray for you here in a second, sister. D.B. Jones, haven't seen you in a while. Glad that you are here. Hope all is well with you. Girlfriend, hang in there. Still love your video that you did. It was awesome. It's chugging along. They got it shadow banned a little bit, but I'm going to see if I can tweak the <laughs> the tags. Uh, Jordan was showing me, uh, telling me some tips on that. See if we can get some higher rankings on that video. It deserves to be seen by the world. Am I never to be humble opinion? And let's see. We got a full play tonight. Sister Angel is uh, going to be joining us shortly. She'll pop in in a little bit. Sister Victoria was supposed to be here tonight, but again, she's not feeling very well. We're going to pray for her. And tonight with me, I have my semi-silent partner in this. I'm going to keep teasing him till he starts talking more. Uh, Brother Ben, want to say hello to everyone this evening? Hello, everyone. It's good to be here once again. I, I do talk. It's just that when I get when I talk, I, I get so excited, and uh, especially if I'm you know, passionate about it, and uh, I, I just get ahead of myself, uh, both in my thoughts and in my speech. So that's why I stammer and stutter. But Whatevs. I do my best. That's, that's okay. We love you for it. I hope your ribs aren't too sore for me poking you there and, and then messing with you. And then uh, Brother Jordan from the channel Revivalists, plural for Christ, has joined us this evening. He was with us last week. Uh, I, I brought him in to help out last week, but he was actually originally scheduled to join us this evening. And I didn't want to push him to the side and say, well, you were on last week. So I brought him in tonight because I wanted him to be able to address the topic he wanted to talk about. Because usually when I have a guest, uh, I want them to talk about whatever's on their heart, the Lord's place on their heart. And this was the talk he came up with. And I was like, oh, you you don't believe in going with lightweight stuff, huh? You're still going to, you're going to come up with some heavy stuff. So brother, brother Jordan, why don't you go ahead and say hello to everyone this evening? Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm super excited about this conversation. This is something I feel very passionate about. I brought the boxing gloves for tonight, but for some reason, I'm wrapped up in all these cords. Like, I've never had this set up a day in my life. So I've been untangling while you and Ben were just talking because it just happened as soon as we started. So <laughs> while I'm doing that, hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. No problem. We'll give you a second to get Get yourself straightened out and detangled there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and begin with prayer. I was just waiting to let a few more stragglers who 
who are chasing that last five minutes like I do come in. That's why I start the broadcast after like 8.05 because I'm always running a little bit late, even in my own broadcast. It's just, it's just how it goes. I've been chasing that last five minutes for the last, hmm, I'm not going to date myself here, many years of my life. Anyway, let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, come before you in the mighty name of King Jesus, and we ask you, Lord, to bless these, your people. We ask you to anoint this broadcast, anoint each and every speaker here tonight. We pray and ask, Lord, that only you be magnified in everything that we have to say this evening. We ask, Lord, that we clearly be able to express our thought and intent to the people who are listening on this broadcast. We pray your anointing on future plays of this broadcast, that people may be uh, edified and receive and hear the intent of what is being communicated to them, Lord Jesus, and that this is in indeed in love, but we will speak the truth, but always in love. And Father, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that if anyone in the listening audience has a need, whether it is in their physical body, in their finances, in their peace of mind, whatever it is, Lord, we ask that you meet that need right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, if they need to feel your presence, that they may feel your presence right now in Jesus' mighty name and know that they are never alone for you have said in your word, you will never leave us nor forsake us. You're with us even until the end of time. And we thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Father, right now for our fellow sister in Christ, we pray for Sister Victoria and uh, we pray that you undergird her and strengthen her right now in her physical body for what she is going through. And we thank you for that, Lord. Minister to her, heal her, and let her be at peace right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, we do have a full plate this evening. I already know it. Um, we're going to begin here shortly. I'm going to turn the mic over to Mr. Jordan, and I've asked him to just run with it until he wants to pause, take a breath so he can sip some water or something, and then we'll ask him questions as we uh, hear what is going on. Hi, Sister Victoria. So glad to see you join us this evening. Praise the Lord. I was <clears throat> supposed to <laughs> share with you some tips and it's like I couldn't get the article that I wanted well one tip that I had let me see if I can find that article again it just went left on me when I was trying to find it um <laughs> I have it here somewhere okay I had told Ben I was teasing him because usually when I start talking about stuff uh he will text me behind the scenes and say, which brand do you use? And, <laughs> oh, yeah, I want to get that. As, he has his credit card out ready to go. But I wanted to talk to you guys about a supplement that is especially important for men, women as well, but women don't need to take quite as much. But for the gentlemen, I know you guys have probably been hearing it on the news and Oh, there's a lot of videos on YouTube about it, guys, if you want to find out more information um, about this particular supplement. It's a natural supplement. It is water-soluble. That means if you were to take a little too much of it, the body would just throw it off. Uh, and that is uh, it's dealing with low testosterone for gentlemen. Um, that is a major problem going on right now. And I understand that a few years ago, a few years ago, it was costing for t testosterone. Uh, those guys that were going and getting that, it was like for 100 milligrams, it's like 100 bucks. Where this particular supplement, which will boost testosterone levels in males uh, and help balance, balance over estrogen in females, particularly after menopause, um, is you know, like 15, 20 bucks for a bottle that may last you a month or longer. So um, it, 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 it would be advisable for you to look into it. Uh, and that is DHEA. Now, <laughs> there is a, with, you know, the uh, medical 
or the long, there's a long word there. I'm not going to even try. <laughs> I'm not going to even try to, to pronounce that word. So uh, <laughs> we'll just begin with the benefits of, of DHEA uh, and how it works, okay? There are over uh, 2,500 medical articles that have been reported on, okay, I might try it. Let me try it. If I butcher it, forgive me in advance. D hydro pienrosterone okay <laughs> i'll spell it d e h y d r o e p i a n d r o s t e r o n e or also known as d h e a it is a hormone secreted from your adrenal glands. As, <laughs> it is taken as a dietary supplement and it has many applications for our overall human health. Now, I wanted to read to you real quickly because I am so eager really to get started with Brother Jordan's topic tonight. I'm excited about it, I really am. Um, almost can't even focus on the art. <laughs> okay, how it works. It helps with uh, aging, a gradual deterioration of various organs and systems, okay? Uh, aging is, is something we are all fighting against as we get older, uh, but it's, it's not just the getting older that's the problem. People don't simply die because they're older. Death results from a failure of different organs in our system. And the example given here is like if you consider your automobile, it doesn't simply stop running without some cause. So like, you know, when something fails in the car, you don't go, oh, it just there's no reason for the failure. You know, there's a problem as to why it's not running. And based on whatever the symptoms are, you go, oh, this is, oh, there's water leaking out over the ground. So it's probably the radiator or the water pump, right? That kind of thing. So it's the same for humans. And one thing about uh, stress in the human body, and I've told you guys about this, we've talked about this numerous times, how stress adversely affects our health. Now they say there's certain levels of stress that are good. And, and there are. There's certain things that just part of your daily life and routine. Those stresses are not harmful. But then there's a point where other stresses added to those stresses can become harmful to our health, especially if they're not kept in check and we don't replenish the things that the body burns off under stress, like B vitamins, vitamin C, and in this case, DHEA. Now, it's my understanding that after about 21, our bodies start losing DHEA at a rapid pace. And by the time somebody reaches 50 years of age, it's almost undetectable in the human body. Uh, it's dropped so low. So let me talk about some of the benefits here. It helps slow the aging process. And things like, it says blood levels of DHEA predict the future development of various age-associated diseases. People with lower DHEA levels are said to be more likely to get arterial sclerosis, heart disease, diabetes, strokes, and cancer. With this decline also comes a concurrent reduction in protein formation and a decrease in muscle mass and an increase in body fat. In a 12-year study of 242 men ages 50 to 79, the men with higher DHEA levels had a 40% reduction in the death rate from heart disease and a 36% reduction in death rate from all other diseases such as strokes and cancer. 
Lower DHEA levels are associated with fatal heart attacks in men. Those men with lower DHEA levels had a greater blockage of their arteries in the heart as proven by specialized heart pictures. There's growing evidence that increasing DHEA levels can reduce arteriosclerosis and blockage of the arteries of the heart. As a matter of fact, DHEA supplementation reduces arteriosclerosis in rabbits by more than 50%. The dramatic effect was accompanied by the de decrease of fat accumulation in the heart. DHEA, DHEA may therefore block the development of arterial sclerosis and help slow aging. Uh, it also helps with stress. I'm not going to belabor this because I'm going to put a link to the article in the description. You guys go back and read it. And then uh, it also helps boost the immune system. It helps with cancer fighting properties for those who are fighting that ailment, as well as mental clarity and mental function. It helps cognition. And there have been studies on all of this stuff. Uh, it also helps with fat loss. So some of y'all, it's already like tweet. Well, let me check this out. And please do your own research. Okay, please just go start reading articles about it. There's published what they call peer review studies and stuff on DHEA. It's tons of information out there on it. Now, for uh, all you married folk, <laughs> it helps improve. Uh, sex. Okay. A decline in libido often accompanies DHEA in men. And this was clearly demonstrated in groundbreaking Massachusetts male aging study, which investigated, among other things, sexual function and activity in men aged 40 to 70. There's tons of information about how it improves uh, the testosterone levels in men, which also affects this. So, again, I'm not going to belabor this. People who are seriously into bodybuilding, this is a supplement you probably already know about. But there's a bunch of information on DHEA concerning muscle mass. So I wanted to point this out to you guys. I'm not going to belabor this. Uh, this article, and give full credit to whom credit is due, was written by Daniel Sanelli. M period SC, uh, and it's called the health benefits of DHEA. And I'll put a link in the description so you guys can go check it out. So I don't know, Ben, if you've already ordered uh, again to Emily. Uh, I think I, I bought not... some tonight, just right before you I came here. I think I, I just randomly grabbed it, put it in the cart. Yeah, I think, I think unless it was DHA. I don't know if that's a thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's DHA or DHEA, but I just think that's funny that, that I, uh, that I did that. I didn't even uh, know why, I, you know, sometimes you just grab something like, I think that's just, <laughs> sorry, my little birdies are shooting. Yeah. That's Ooh, just it, so weird. It, it wouldn't be you, Angel. It, that great stuff. Oh, and now listen, that was the scratching the surface. I'm actually rushing so we can get, <laughs> we can get to Jordan. I don't want to take up too much of his time, but there's it was labeled as like a blood sugar manage, like as if it managed your blood yes. sugar. Yes, it, 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 it's a it's that a hormone balancer. It helps with insulin and metabolizing carbs. That's what I'm saying, guys. You got to research DHEA. What are the um, odds? That's Holy Spirit, well, guys. Well, I well, just grabbed it at random and then it's her tip tonight. That's so weird. Before I'm you continue, Ben, wait, yeah. I haven't properly introduced Sister Angel. And again, when you hear the birds in the background, that's just her. That's just, it's yeah, always going to be there, guys. It's going to be something in the background. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Sister Angel, would you like to say hello to everyone tonight? Hi, guys. I, uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry I'm late. I was a criminal uh, tonight. No, I wasn't, but I got profiled. I got very unjustly <laughs> profiled as, as an as a, as a armed, or no, as a burglar. They, I got pulled over for what I thought was a traffic in, in crack. Like I thought I was, I thought I was speeding. Um, and they kept me for an inordinate amount of time and didn't tell me what, like what was going on. And it was like a, one of those big SUV, like they don't norm, like not normally a traffic stop. Well, it turns out 
they've been watching me because I, I have a tendency where I'll like look at dumpsters and stuff as I'm leaving oh. the store because I want to see if any cool stuff is in there. Like, or, or scavenge. I just scavenge. Well, that wasn't like a problem, but the thing was, was that somebody, uh, my vehicle matched like the exact description of somebody that's been going around breaking into stuff at night and stealing. It's like the exact same car. And so mm-hmm. they saw me being creepy and, and weird, like I do, uh, when I start scavenging. That's all I do. I just like to scavenge, you know, junk. I'm like one of those weirdos that's like a picker. And and sometimes <laughs> the best time to do is at night because people aren't watching you. It's not that I'm doing anything illegal by doing it, I don't think. I don't think most of the time. Some stores don't want you in their dumpsters, but they should try harder uh, to keep you up and, or let you know about it. Like, blows. I don't think they like to see you do that. But so they kept me and then. Uh, I, I don't know why they like, I don't know if they think it's realistic that it could have, I guess they thought maybe I was driving the vehicle because I doubt they thought I was working by myself doing all these robberies. But uh, so like, you know, 30, 40 minutes later, I was finally informed that that was why. And I was like, really just thought he was being a jerk by keeping me forever. Like, you know, sometimes cops will just take forever to give you a warning, just a mm-hmm. warning and they take forever. But so that, that, and I did not get us to um, okay, good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I was going to tell you that, uh, okay, yeah, I'm going to pull out the race card here. Being black, they always tell us when they stop us that there, our vehicle fit the description of something it that went down in the area. It's definitely because I'm black. But that's no, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's totally because the... I'm black. He knows. That okay, I'm, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> saying that. Okay. Yes, what I'm kidding. saying is that's what I know, but that's what they always say. They always Did go, it. oh, uh, your vehicle fit the description of something that went down in the area just prior to them stopping you because they have to have probable cause when uh, you haven't done anything to stop you. So that's one of the things they use. But just just say you can go hear it every a the lot one of people. Time talk I do it. think a cop was being racist when I when he dealt with me and my friend. They did give me some bogus thing like that. Like there's been vandalism in the area. That's why we're stop. I'm stopping you as you're walking down the street. Like you're not. I'm just walking and he, he no, stopped me because he wanted you to. You were driving so. while having a black person in the car. No, anyway. we were walking. We were just walking. We were walking. Okay. This was an Asian walking. cop, by the way. The <laughs> Asian cop is the only time I've ever seen a cop be unabashedly like he was like, you don't look like you're from around here. I swear, it's the first thing he said when he pulled up, said that to Nico. You don't look like you're from around here, like he was in the wrong neighborhood. It was crazy. I knew Angel wasn't going to let me play the black card without challenging me. <laughs> anyway, Brother <laughs> Ben, <laughs> what, 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 uh, what did you have to say? I interrupted you, brother. I want you to be able to finish your thought. I'm sorry. No, it's no big deal. I was just saying there is such a thing as DHA. Uh, or, okay. Yeah, just yeah, just just DHA because I was looking at my supplements and I don't. I think a lot of um. Omega three pills come with DHA. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I looked at mine, and um, it, there is a such thing as DHA. So, but is I don't it similar. Think, I don't think so. And no, I think, I, no. I think that, it's unlikely that you would. I think you probably did get DHA. DHEA. I don't think DHA right. is is uh, a, a standalone supplement, really. Uh, that's why. Yeah, I didn't. I thought they just maybe put it in milk or something so, lately. But hmm. it, I just think that's so weird. Like I, I literally had no idea what it did. I just for some reason grabbed it. So I think God wanted you guys uh, listening to hear about this this uh, supplement tonight because I, I, it's just strange that this makes coincidence. Yeah, I don't oh, believe in coincidences either, and that's that's not, that, that's pretty cool, sister. I um, never do that. I never. I'll never like just pick up a vitamin that I don't know what it is or. <laughs> and just get it but um i do have a tip also because i didn't do mine last week. oh do you okay well before yeah, we continue mine. i just wanted to find out how's your budgie doing he is much better he is very very happy and he, he's, he's able to fly still so he's uh his wings all better and um he, they're shrouded in a aluminum screen like veil <laughs> over their cage now i mean they can see and everything but mm-hmm. that's the only thing i could think of to keep the time I can't believe cats can scratch them through a cage. I've had birds my whole life, and I didn't know that was, like, even plausible. And it happened twice. So, yeah. um, But if anyone ever tells you that if a cat scratches a small bird, that it's certain death and don't even don't even think twice, like, they're going to die, hope is lost, that's, like, not true. Um, I, it, the infection can be bad. Um, you know, especially if they bite. But I use colloidal silver. 
uh, I always, I mean, I, I use it on all my pets, like, you know, for maintenance, like a little bit, like every week in their water. And I, you know, I, I didn't even get them to the vet the, the, right away. It was not till the next uh, morning. Um, and, you know, they, they wouldn't tell me like how often they die from it, mm -hmm. but they made it sound like there was, and it was so minor, but like, it was such a, it was just a little nick. Really, I mean, he did bleed quite a bit, and his he was, his wing was swollen, but it, it was just it wasn't like it didn't do like actual damage. But mm -hmm. they did kind of give me like they made it seem like just their normal antibiotics aren't reliable in terms of like guaranteeing a good outcome. So mm -hmm. I and again recommend boil silver, especially for pets, uh, because this is you know I, I've noticed this a lot, especially when taking pets to the vet. They uh, like with infections, they, they don't, they're like lost to see about how to treat it. I mean, they get from it, you know, mo like most doctors and, and you know, most human doctors are too, but, but um, I've seen little silver uh, work wonders because he recovered so fast and, uh, you know, didn't, you know, he didn't start puffing up or getting fevers or anything. And, but if you look online, that's what you'll see. It's that if a cat scratches your buggy, it's dead. And, uh, and it, he's had it happen twice in the past uh, couple of months and uh, he, he's fine. But my, my, my tip was just comfrey. If you guys have heard about the, the plant comfrey, um, you know, it's actually, pre it's, it's, it's beautiful, I think. It has like um, pretty like um, uh, pink uh, or blue uh, flowers, um, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's just kind of like a silvery green uh, leaf plant. Um, that is considered a weed, but it is kind of a, it's a miracle plant. <laughs> it's one of those. And, you know, especially if you're somebody that's, um, you know, farming or trying to get into like homesteading or, or even if you just, you know, landscape, um, you can not only, and I'll tell you about the health benefits, because that's really the biggest draw for me. But I also recently found out that it's a plant that you can grow and it'll spread like a weed, kind of like, I don't know, burdock or something. Like it spreads through a root system. Um, and you can grow like a big patch of it. And then three or four times a year, you can cut all the, the foliage off and use that, just put it on top of your plants. It's like fertilizer. So the, the leaves themselves act as a fertilizer for, for uh, crops and, you know, even like ornamental plants in the landscape. And I, I can't really think of anything where you don't have to compost it first before it becomes, you know, fertilizer. But apparently this is a catching on. Like people are, especially homesteaders, are growing comfrey like crazy now because you can you can cut it down, just, you know, cut the, the foliage, it'll grow right back. And this, you can do it, you know, multiple times a year and fertilize your plants with the leaves. Uh, mm -hmm. which should tell us a lot about how healthy, you know, healthy it might be for our bodies, right? Because, and I found uh, that it's, it's great for, for certain things. It's like maybe the only thing that I found that helps, you know, like uh, leg ulcers or foot ulcers, which I tend, well, which I've gotten in the past. Uh, it's like something that happens here. I'm pregnant. Uh, I, I, you know, twice now I've gotten some type of little ulcer on my, on my leg or my foot. And didn't know how to treat it. it. Was just it was. I didn't know what it was at first. It was you know it didn't really look like much, but it hurt so bad. And you know you can't treat it just like you would maybe like a boil or something else. Like that will cause massive pain. It'll make it worse if you treat it the wrong way. For I, I don't know understand all the dynamics of ulcers, but it's it's something that it's like having a raw nerve just exposed on your skin. And and every time you get up in the morning and put your feet down to stand up all the blood rushes to that area and it's like a thunderclap of like the most unimaginable pain it, it was it was just as bad as contractions when i was having a baby like that's that's how bad this this pain was that i felt and comfrey i found was um was known to be an incredible treatment for for ulcers for whatever reason and they're tricky to, to treat and um the leaves of comfrey are actually scientifically proven if they, you know, make a, you just take like the raw leaf and apply it over a broken bone, it's proven to actually speed the healing of the bone, or like it heals broken bones. I don't even know how. It must be something about all the nutrients that it has in these, in, in its leaves. Why it fertilizes plants is somehow it speeds up the process of healing, um, you know, in your tissues also. And it, it relieves pain um, uh, very well. It's, it's a very good uh, pain reliever that way. I put a leaf on my foot uh, the other night because I'm dealing with this tiny little ulcer and it I have the ointment too but that actual raw leaf 
uh, which had actually been on the floor for like a few hours. I didn't notice that it fell off, uh, but it was still so potent that it, it, it was like a marked difference. I could feel in the morning it didn't hurt to step down on the floor. So um, the benefits of this plant are, uh, there's, there's plenty more, but I thought those were the two coolest things is that, um, you know, it's great for wound treatment and it's like one of the only things that works for ulcers. But it also, it, I mean, what could be better than growing fertilizer that you don't even mm -hmm. have to, I mean, composting is a pain in the butt. I, it's fun. I, I like doing it. It's like a fun, like little obsession I have where I like make the best compost, but it takes forever. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And uh, to imagine, like having something where you can actually just chop it down and put it on top of your, like mulch your plants with it and it feeds them is, uh, is amazing. Hopefully you guys look into that. They're not expensive. I think they grow now, like they're, they're, you know, they're a weed to quote unquote, but I think that like people see them less and less in the, in the wild now, just, you know, growing by themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why they, they you know, something is uh, interfering with their natural range, which is usually like, you know, temperate climates. Like, I don't know that it grows in Florida, but I, I know it's supposed to grow in Indiana. But um, you can order it or order the seeds, root cuttings. I just uh, was in a hurry, so I ordered an actual little plant, and then I got some root cuttings also. So I would recommend that if anybody's interested. I would recommend, if you can, start out with the plant. Because the, the root cuttings and stuff they sell, it might take like a year. It, like, won't, it won't be until next season, next year, uh, that, uh, that you actually get a plant out of it. But it will spread once it starts growing. But um, I, I, I just preferred to get a plant also just to, just to have it on hand because I know that it'll grow fast and at least provide a lot of the leaves for medicinal use. In the meantime, it'll, it'll take a minute to grow your own crop to where you can actually use it for fertilizer. You know, it'll probably take like a year or two to get, get to that point, but, um, but awesome. And uh, like, you know, there's probably so much more we don't even know because if it fertilizes plants like that, like I said, without having to decompose it or, you know, have for it to break down at all first like you're so most of the time you, you don't even want to put stuff like that on top of your plants because it's going to heat up and you know uh it's not going to be immediately digestible for your plants it's all i can put it but something about the concrete leaves i mean obviously they're going to decay on the ground there where you place them but so, so, somehow they immediately release their nutrients uh in the process so um, and usually what's good for plants is good for us, you know, uh, you know, there's a, there's something to, there's something in common with, um, you know, things that are nutritious, uh, uh, and like, just, just like I always say with weeds, there is never going to be an easy way to get rid of weeds because like, no matter what, if you think there's an easy way, it's going to turn out that it's going to like make your face fall off or it gives you some horrible cancer 10 years later, like Roundup. <laughs> Because God designed it that way. It can't be easy to get rid of the weeds. Why? Because he, it's not easy for God himself to get rid of the human weeds. He has to, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, that's the analogy you have in scripture. It's, uh, you know, the weeds are there for a reason. So that it's like an object lesson for us. But also, um, and I think that's why, uh, if you, you know, men are also compared to trees, you know, metaphorically in the Bible. So I have this theory that, you know, basically the idea that something could be toxic to plants and non-toxic to humans is totally impossible and vice versa. Usually, usually if it's beneficial to plants, it's going to be, uh, and I mean, actually beneficial, I don't mean like, you know, steroid hormones that make them grow fast so that they die or whatever. But, mm -hmm. you, you know, we have things in common because of, of, of uh, well, all living things. Right. So, so I just think it's a, as a, a cool thing to look at uh, basically that concrete could be so if you heal broken bones and also somehow fertilize plants like like immediately <laughs> i'd like to get to the bottom of like what what is so incredible about it um what it contains but i i didn't actually do that but um but and they're cheap to order too they're not like some fancy plant that you have to spend a lot of money on so hopefully some people will will try it out because i don't i don't see anybody growing it uh you know mm. commonly like neighbors and stuff like maybe mm -hmm. upstairs now but it, it's a, uh, it's kind of a lost, uh, a lost art, I guess. People didn't even uh, know about it until recently and it got popular. But um, other than that, that's, that's, uh, that's all I got. And uh, oh. my little bird is trying to <laughs> perch on the ceiling. I'll, I got to mute for a second because he doesn't, he, he's falling. I had to okay. catch him, but he it. Okay, Angel, hand, handle your bird crisis. And we understand. Uh, I wanted to point out, though, that uh, what 
a lot of people don't realize that they call weeds are actually mm -hmm. edible, like dandelions. I was yep. so hot when I found that out because I was, I was like, what is food? Dandelions, you can put them in your salad. They taste great. Um, you can steep medicine. them. Yep. You can steep them as tea. They Don't believe me. Go buy dandelion tea right now. You can check online. And they're charging money. And they're telling you that it's a weed. <laughs> and it has medicinal uh, purposes. And I said, only a devil would, <laughs> would tell you that something that is a food and has medicinal properties is a weed well and the most uh, abundant and hard to get rid of weeds like a uh, plantain and dandelion you might not know what plantain is but you've seen it everywhere it's you, you would know it if you if you google they'd be like oh that thing they're called plantains there's like two mm -hmm. different forms of them those are like the two most abundant and commonly seen weeds i don't care like anywhere i've gone in the u.s uh, and hard to get rid of and they're also two of the most incredibly like healthy for you like to, to consume or use as medicine like plantain is what you can chew up and make a uh what is it decoction when you chew something up and and you know and make a paste and put it on bug bites like right there if you're out outside and you have a heart get a bad bug bite you can chew up uh plantain leaves uh and they're non-toxic and they cure cancer and all this other amazing stuff right uh and just mm -hmm. uh, you make a paste out of it and right away it takes that sting away um, and I just think it's so funny how God just like sprinkles dandelion and plantain all over the place, knowing we're going to just walk over it or hate it or resent it, yank it up. And it's like, turns out like, oh, that was the cure to cancer. <laughs> 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 of course you would do that. Okay. And, and it, uh, I told you guys, the earth, I've said this before, I'll say it again. The earth screams abundance. Contrary to what they put in the media and all these articles and stuff, the earth screams abundance. And the Lord promised that while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, right, shall not fail. That shall, When it says shall not fail, that's a declaration by the living God. Just like that song says, the sun will come out tomorrow. Well, the same thing. It's a declaration. And, and in that passage, it does say that the sun and, and moon and all that will it's never going to cease. And the same thing is true with being able to grow your own food. That's why they got to outlaw it. And they actually got stuff. I think they've already passed some stuff here in America. HR, I don't remember what it is, house resolution, whatever. The, the When they get ready to say you can't grow food, they, you know, that's what they're going to enforce. So does that sound, does that sound like something that God-fearing, human-loving people would do? No, it does not. Not at all. Sounds like something the devil would do. So, okay. <laughs> all right, Mr. Jordan, we should give you enough time to get untangled there. I was just presuming you had like tripped over and fell and literally had yourself all tied up in knots. So I wanted to make sure I gave you plenty of time. To oh, yeah. Untangled. <laughs> My microphone is going to be the best twister partner, I tell you what. And I just love all the information you guys are sharing. I'm sitting here eating <laughs> I'm taking one Reese's Pieces at a time. I'm like, this is great. This is, I love health. This is great. So, and I'm so glad to eat them. <laughs> well, you know, Reese's Pieces. I know how you feel. I'm uh, saying too. I, not with the candy, but plenty of other things. Like, guys, try the dandelion. Just, you know, and, and I'm just going to go eat, like, uh, English muffins with jelly for dinner. Like, <laughs> the dandelion covered. Actually, yeah. That should be my helpful tip. If y'all haven't tried English muffins with Greek yogurt, that is a great substitute for like a jelly filled donut. What? It's See, amazing. Like honey and Greek All yogurt? Right. Like Greek yogurt with honey? Excuse me, it's man. Like it's time to cut his mic off because <laughs> he's going to have us gaining 12 pounds before the weekend is over telling us about stuff like that. English muffins are like crack. If you really start to appreciate them, they're like crack. When I, I, I always just took them for granted and then I, I'm addicted to them lately. And it's not They're good. amazing. Yeah, they are. But the, only the ones with the nooks and crannies, though. Sometimes you get bad batches. Uh, oh, brands yeah. that you think are okay and they're just like mm. flat on the point yeah but the no, not, not all of them are point. yes they are you can't <laughs> toast them too much you gotta just barely toast them i think some people they over toast them and then they think these are terrible but like 
that's because they're hard and they become like <laughs> sharp and painful to chew. Right. Uh, but they're, they're, I just figured that out not too long ago. So <laughs> that was another tip. Pose them just barely. And then Somehow you know, I have the feeling that if, if we ever had a meetup, it would definitely mm. be over food. <laughs> and, <laughs> and like I said, we might gain like five or 10 pounds before we leave the meetup because I have a feeling you guys all love food, probably with the exception of Ben. I mean, he's the only person that goes, uh, you know, I don't even eat for taste or enjoyment. I eat for health. It's like, Ben, shh, be quiet, honey. Don't. But <laughs> I, I, I used it for the to rest love of food us. more. At pregnancy kind of ruined me because, like, I can, I, I only eat what I'm craving, and I don't ever know what I'm craving. Actually, like, it's very hard for me to know, like, once I figure it out, like, oh, that's what I want. Then I'll just eat that for, like, a month or two solid like that's all I want to eat because I don't have enough after all the kids I don't have enough time to sit there and like go on a taste adventure and figure out what do I really want to be eating these days like I just have to like just you know have something on standby for when I have to eat like it's gone too long I gotta eat and I I will eat this I will eat this English muffin because I ever even when I'm not pregnant I, I ever since pregnancy I if I don't like want it or like if I'm not craving it I just won't I won't be able to eat it it's so weird uh it, ru it like ruins me mentally but yes I do love food in theory like uh it's just so hard to like pursue the foods you love when you have a bunch of kids that all want to eat different things every time that they <laughs> eat a meal they all want individual meals so until that changes I just like have no uh <laughs> I like I can't enjoy food very often uh, because I, I that would just be another thing to add to the menu of me trying to, to you know cook for like you know seven different people three times a day is too much <laughs> oh you poor dear that's oh man so do you make yeah. me tired just listening to you sister angel explain some of this stuff <laughs> yes. all right mr ben uh you said you did not have a helpful tip for us this evening is that correct no i, I i'm a fail this week no <laughs> stop it i'm gonna see you need to stop that i told you about that self-deprecating stuff but i only okay. had one because i didn't get to do it last week i, I wouldn't have had another oh. if it, i would have uh it, i would have forgotten or failed to come up with one, so. <laughs> that and and then your birds are gonna are you in another room now because i don't hear the birds anymore so Yes, briefly. Okay. My, 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 yeah, I always tease her. <laughs> if it's not her, if it's not her birds preaching in the background, it's the babies preaching in the background. So, <laughs> all right, Mr. Jordan, I think you're ready to go. We've given you enough time to get untangled, even if your mic is going to be your new twister partner. Yeah, um, I actually, because I was going to make a joke about these Reese's Pieces and like look up the vitamin count, and I can't believe what I've just been putting in my body for the last half hour. This is crazy. I need to go eat a dandelion. But <laughs> I am super excited, and I'm very passionate about this topic. So a lot of people who either tune in for my podcast, tune in for CES, or even tune in to listen to me last week, they're probably very used to hearing my tone in one direction but my tone will probably be very different tonight just because this is this is where my particular calling is the strongest is these cults because it's one thing to be in a false religion it's one thing to be an atheist but it's a whole other thing when you think you are a bible believing christian and you have the wrong gospel those people always have a very special place in my heart um, so to me, it's something that I get very passionate about. It wasn't too long ago. It was literally right before I started CES. I had a sit down meeting with one of these cults, um, because one of their hopeful converts, um, reached out to me and, um, they said, well, would you be willing to speak with these, uh, members? So I had the chance to preach the real gospel. And then they invited me next week for all of them to gang up on me and scream at me for an hour and a half. And they're like, how do you know you have the Holy Spirit? And I'm just like, cause I'm the only one that's not twitching. But the thing is, um, I think we live in a day and age where everybody wants to coexist. And as Christians, we can't do that. I do not care to coexist because everybody's going to have an eternity to coexist in hell if they really want that. 
And I'm just putting it blatant. That doesn't make me a legalist. That just makes me a realist. If you die without receiving the real gospel, you are going to hell. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ was enough, that was the sufficient sacrifice, and you're trusting in yourself at all, you are not saved. I do not care. Like, it's very important to preface it with that, because what we're going to see, um, we're going to be talking about a couple of these cults that sprung up in the 1800s, and they all have something that's in common. You have this person who rises up as their founder with some kind of divine revelation. You have people who take their authority and their teachings and put it on par with the Bible. You have people who know how to pressure people to the point where it creates trauma. And then salvation is only available through that call. And then it also causes people to ostracize themselves in the world today. Um, and it's the, the analogy that I use is the fact that, think of it this way, you know, we know that once we are a born again believer, we are body, soul, and spirit. Think of your body as a car. Think of Jesus as a driver. And think of yourself as, um, or I'm sorry, Jesus as like the spirit in us is the driver in the car. And then we are the soul in the passenger seat. As a passenger, it would be absolutely ridiculous to get on an interstate, have somebody have their foot on the gas pedal, but you're trying to steer it from the passenger seat. That seems absolutely ridiculous. How could you ever trust yourself to do that? If you can, like, I mean, kudos, you probably got some kind of criminal background or something, though. But what I want to start with is because there's so much that the 1800s encompass, and Basically, what we are looking at in terms of the 1800s, and I know that Lisa said that we could probably have this conversation ongoing in future. So that's why I kind of like really narrowed it down to this specific uh, topic. It's because it's my personal belief that the 1800s birthed a lot of uh, heretical movements, and there was a real evil spirit that shifted. Um, the direction of the world. I mean, America was less than 50 years old at this point, and it really became a catalyst of religious freedom. Uh, we know that what we're looking at in the 1800s is the Second Great Awakening, as well as the Restoration Movement, which I'll go into a little bit about what both those are. But Basically, if you're wondering, Second Great Awakening, what was the First Great Awakening? Well, that was our <laughs> that was our Calvinist friends, the Reformed preachers, the Puritans. Uh, um, what was it? The sermon "America in the Hands of an Angry God," I think. Um, so that's that. So the Second Great Awakening was in retaliation to this teaching, almost that oh, there's an elect, there is those who are predestined to be damned. We don't like that teaching, so we are going to go out and we are going to make our own teachings. And this is actually where we see an emphasis due to the fact of the market revolution and the transportation that was taking place through um, the Erie Canal as well as, oh gosh, what's that big canal that goes down through Louisiana? I can't even remember. I should have wrote it down. <laughs> Basically, transportation became a lot more fluent and people were able to almost operate internationally in this known world. And th this created um, the ability to have what was called camp meetings or circuit riders. These were basically traveling ministries to areas that did not have ministries already available in them because the eastern part of the United States, not like we have to think of the states that were involved in there. So it's the eastern part of the discovered states at that point. They were very well established with their churches <clears throat> and a lot of them were reformed. Are these new Western parts needed their own um, theology. And this is, especially in Rochester, New York, this was a huge breakout point. And I'm kind of located in this general region. So I know quite a bit about like some of the history that has uh, influenced the, how this, how these teachings have influenced our culture rather. And this really sparked the whole 
idea that our lifestyle matters and people use that to monopolize on labor. It's like, well, if you are a good Christian, you are going to be a good worker. So they started manipulating that way. So we started seeing lifestyle matters being equated to good works, equated to salvation. And religion became very democratized. And um, it was very much appreciated by people who were in poorer status or people who um, would have been frowned upon in society. So I say that to give us a very brief overview of what we are looking at in terms of the Second Great Awakening uh, leading into the 1800s, which later would be picked up by the Restoration Movement, which was all just, uh, it was this concept of restoring the church back to the original New Testament church. So when we look at the cults that sprung up in the 1800s, um, I'm not going to talk about Christian science because it doesn't really, I think this would be a great one and possibly a topic all of its own in another broadcast. Uh, it doesn't quite fit with these other four that I'm going to be talking about today. Christian science basically says, you know, we are all pretty much living in God's simulation. And if we are um, experiencing sin, it's due to these reasons behind beyond our comprehension and sin also is tied to our illness sickness death um so it's just it's almost like the very first prosperity preachers almost but rebranded in this very philosophical idea that none of us actually exist so when we look at the four major cults that have really shifted theology and have many adherers, we are looking at the Mormon Church, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, as well as the quote-unquote Church of Christ, um, which the latter is one that I was personally involved with at one point. So I think I'll get the two big ones out of the way that everyone's just like, well, that's just absurdity. Um, the first one is the Mormon Church, which if you guys saw my preview earlier, I know Lisa did, <laughs> uh, they literally worship somebody by the name of Moroni, so they literally worship a moron. It's crazy. But, so we're looking at the founder here, which was Joseph Smith Jr., and he was, um, born in Sharon, Claremont, and basically, he has two... I guess you could call them visions. Um, the first one, he saw God, the Father, and Jesus, these personages, um, even though the Bible says that no man has seen God the Father. And then in 1823, the angel showed him these golden plates, and Jesus appeared um, in America in Actually, the true Judeo-Christian history of the American civilization was tied to the Native Americans. So Jesus came to preach to the Native Americans who are the quote-unquote true Israelites. And then they had a battle with Moroni, and the Native Americans won and hid the tablet. So apparently these Native Americans were more powerful than God. And then in 1830, this is where we get the pub, uh, published translation of those plates, which is the Book of Mormons. And I actually, I don't know where I put it. I had it available um, because I was going to quote something from it tonight, but I don't know where I put it. But I'm very disorganized. <laughs> so, uh, but then in 1831, Smith and the Fathers moved. Uh, to build sort of like a communion, um, and it was called American Zion, and it was cut off from the rest of society, so a very Jim Jones-esque type thing. Uh, and it first gathered in Kirtland, Ohio, and then uh, they created an outpost in, Indo uh, outpost in Independence, Missouri, uh, which was intended to be Zion's center place. And then during the 30s, um, they sent out missionaries and published the revelations, and they supervised the Kirtland Temple. And so the, there was a lot that happened there. There was a lot of violence that occurred with non-Mormons. Um, it caused the Mormon church to then scatter. 
Um, they were involved with some bad banking practices. And then Joseph Smith was in prison in Carthage, Illinois, and then was killed when a mob ransacked the prison, uh, which caused the Mormons to flee to Utah, which they presently reside in. Um, so basically, the Mormon church crumbled because they tried to black out the media and control the banks. So, um, sorry, I, I got away on a tangent. I lost my place in my notes. But, um, so the thing is, he they believe that he did more than what Jesus did, which is just absolutely crazy. Um, when we look at the text that they use, like I said, they have the Book of Mormon, which literally, if you guys have seen the Book of Mormon, it literally says another testament of Jesus Christ. Nice. And then you have, yeah. And then they have the KJV Bible. Uh, they also have Doctrine and Covenants and then the Pearl of Great Price. And the thing is, the New Testament is the everlasting testament. So to say that they came in with the New Testament is just already blasphemy. Um, but we also have to realize that there has to continue to be this pattern. If they're going to claim that they restored the original church, that would mean that the original church would had to have been lost. There always has to be a believer to spread the gospel message to a non-believer. Now, I understand that there are some other ways that the gospel can get around, but to say that God had lost control of his church up until the 1800s is the most absurd thing. And the fact that this testament of um, these Native Americans was not founded until this New Yorker, who was not very mentally equipped, uh, then discovered is just complete absurdity. Uh, so their whole thing is, we believe the Bible as long as it's interpreted correctly. So basically, if they're given permission to twist it however they want. Uh, they deny the Godhead. They believe in many gods. They believe that they will become gods themselves if they are good Mormons. The funny part is, they always refer to God as Elohim. And Elohim is actually plural. <laughs> Elohim is one of the words that I point out when it comes to the names and titles of God to um, prove the Godhead. Because Elohim is one of those words that's used in Genesis, and it's right around the time where he's talking about let us create man in our image. So it's just, it's very funny that they chose that one, but we know that, you know, the devil doesn't really have the best people to choose from, let's be honest. <laughs> so, um, but we have this doctrine of eternal progression that was introduced into the church of Lorenzo Stone or Lorenzo Snow. And basically it's this whole idea that, you know, God created us. We're going to create more gods. There's going to be more gods. And the problem with that is it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that somewhere in that pattern, there would have had to have been a God that always existed. There's no, like, it had to have been a point. So why is it our God is not the infinite God? Why is it that they believe God was once a man who, through being a good Mormon, now became a God and we uh, rule with him? So that's kind of what we are looking at in terms of what their gospel messages, what their endpoint is. Um, they believe, they say, in one God, but what you have to ask them is, do you believe in one God in just this universe? Because they don't. They don't believe in one God. So you have to learn their language. Um, and also a couple of verses, I'm not going to... For time's sake, I'm not going to hop around to all of them. But if you guys ever are interacting with a Mormon, a couple of verses that you can write down um, to show that God is an everlasting God, um, meaning that there was no one before and there will mm -hmm. be no one after. Uh, you can go to Psalms 92. Um, you can go to Isaiah 63, 16. If you want to show Jesus as the everlasting God, you can go to Micah 5 too. Um, and then, yeah, I, those are some good ones right there. Um, if you guys want more 
I can always go into. But basically, to it's like I said, you have to acknowledge at some point that there was an everlasting God. And all the Mormons are doing are believing the original lie that was said in Genesis, Genesis 3, 4, that you can become a God yourself. And um, let me see here. I wanted to take a look at this one verse in 1 Corinthians. Um, because they often use 1 Corinthians 8, 5. And I just want to pull it up so I can read it real quick. Um, so it says, For thou there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. So they'll say this to prove that there are many gods. The thing is, the context of this, and they're ignoring verse 4, is the context that we're talking about idolatry. Um, mm -hmm. And we know that they are not legitimate gods. They are demons. And this desire to become a god does not make you a god. It makes you a devil. In Isaiah mm -hmm. 44, 6, it says there is no other God. And um, th again, they'll say, well, that's just no other God in this universe. But the thing is, <laughs> now, this is where they trap themselves. They'll admit Jesus is a God. Well, if God is the only God in this universe, are you not saying that Jesus and God are one? They're going to trap mm -hmm. themselves in their own argument. Um, but that I think another verse, I wrote it down. I think I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but another one you can take them to is Isaiah 45 5. If I wrote that down correctly, I don't know what it says off the top of my head. Um, but the other thing that they teach that's very heretical is they teach that Jesus is um the brother of Satan. It was just that Jesus is the firstborn, but the enemy is in that line. And they'll come out and say, well, we don't explicitly teach that. But you do. <laughs> you do. Um, because basically they say Elohim is the father of them all. Uh, we were all spirits in heaven at one point. So and this is what I don't, not to go off on a complete side tangent, but if we were all in heaven at one point, okay, quick backstory. So this is what they'll say. Um, Basically, there had to be this plan of salvation. Well, first of all, if we're all in heaven, why is why does there need to be a plan of salvation? And basically, mm -hmm. everybody took a vote on Jesus's plan of salvation, which is the plan we have today, and um, voted against Satan's plan of salvation, um, which is so funny because what Satan's plan of salvation was, was to teach them how to become gods. So, so you're admitting this is from the devil, this whole concept of wanting to become gods. Like, they don't see how they trap themselves here. Um, but so those who were on Jesus' side, those um, were that those are the ones that are going to be saved. And those who are not the enemy will not, although they do not believe in hell um, the way we do. Um, but they're, they're also incredibly racist. This is something they won't admit. They'll they'll say everybody who sided with Jesus was born white and everybody who sided with Satan was born black. And that's something they just conveniently leave out or choose to ignore. Um, and it's funny, Lisa, because you, mm -hmm. uh, you brought this up um, when you were telling me uh, something about Isaiah 14, 12. And Isaiah 14, 12 is the only time the name Lucifer is ever mentioned in the Bible. And the thing is, these new versions will use uh, morning and day star in place of Lucifer. And we know from, let's, I just have a couple of written right here, Revelations 22, 16, that Jesus is called the bright morning star. Uh, there's a couple of other, I won't go through them all, but the, the critical text came up in the 1800s. And this will be a whole other thing that we can talk about some other Point, but a mm -hmm. lot of these texts were brought up to bolster these cults. Mm -hmm. And so we need to realize like where our beliefs differ is we believe Jesus is the only begotten God, not the first uh not the first begotten son. Um 
and this is where I had some of those quotes written down, but I can't find the Book of Mormon. So I do own a Book of Mormons, but <laughs> I obviously don't take very good care of it. So. <laughs> um, but so technically, going back to that concept of hell, they technically believe in hell, but they believe in different levels. So they believe that we become gods erecting spiritual babies essentially that will eventually become gods themselves and this is all a misquote of the three uh heavens um they believe in a telestial kingdom for the mm -hmm. unrepentant um and then outer darkness and those are the devils and those who the son of perditions who committed the unpardonable sin um the thing is they only believe that people will remain in hell for the 1000 years and then that then we're all good. So it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, they also teach that all animals have souls and are atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, and the thing is, I've, I've had this question before, is like, well, will animals be in heaven? The thing that I say is Jesus didn't die for animals and not going on a whole tangent of that. I'm just going to point you to the very disgusting fact. Do you really think Jesus died for all those cockroaches that are dying? Like, mm. You think heaven's gonna be filled with cockroaches? Like, let's let's be real about this. Um, but they always have apostles too. So the thing with the apostles is they always use 12, but they ignore very much in Acts 1 the requirements for being an apostle, which is they had to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. And that was the whole point of being an apostle was they were witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, and then their whole theology on the baptism of dead, which was just a misquote of 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, so that's the Mormons. <laughs> the Jehovah Witnesses, um, now this is where we have to be careful. The Jehovah Witnesses aren't always referred to as Jehovah Witnesses. When they started, they were actually studied as the Bible study movement. Um, and it wasn't until 1931 that they were officially deemed the Jehovah Witnesses. So when you hear Bible students, definitely inquire more about that. Uh, they were very much part of this restoration movement. They were also very big into millennialism, which really sparked in the 1800s with the dawn of dispensationalism. And this is really what provoked the Second Great Awakening is everybody was looking for the second coming of Jesus in the 1800s. So this is where the teaching of amillennialism and premillennialism and all that really came out. Um, but you'll also sometimes hear them called Russellites because their founder is Charles Taze Russell. Um, and then, um, give me one second. I have a couple of their other names written down here. Uh, international Bible students, Associated Bible students, Independent Bible students. So if you hear any of these words, we are talking about Jehovah Witnesses. And the formation stems from the Zion's Watchtower Tract Society in 1881. And that society is what propelled the literature. And we know that there's a lot of Watchtower magazines to this day. And the thing is, there were three schisms in the Jehovah Witnesses, and this, put a bookmark in this, because it's going to be very important to remember when we talk about the Seventh-day Adventists, but basically in 1909, the International became the Free Bible Study Students. Uh, in, from 1916 to 1919, the Associated, uh, the Associated Bible Students became the Home Missionary Movement, and then in 1920 to 1931, 31, became the Jehovah Witnesses, which are no longer Bible students, and they're the ones that are pre presently known today. Um, so this is a great um, lesson in realizing who you're doing your Bible studies with, because this is all formed from a Bible study. And if mm. you do not have a church or a body of believers to anchor yourself into, but it can get crazy really fast. And so some of their beliefs, they don't believe that Jesus is God. They actually believe that he is Michael the Archangel. Um, and it's 
for, see right there is a perfect example because how do you open your Bible and arrive at that conclusion? And mm -hmm. all we are talking about here is that whole, that Bible verse. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's that whole concept of being thrown to and fro uh, every wind of doctrine. And um, yeah, let me ask you a question since you paused. Yeah, so give you a chance to sip some water there. <laughs> I know I'm so thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't hear you. You might be getting ready to go there, but I wanted to ask you, what is your knowledge about the whole thing about connected to Jehovah Witnesses and the Watchtower Society? Um, so the Watchtower Society and their connection, um, I actually wasn't going to go there. Um, is there something that you know that I don't know, Lisa? No, 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 no. It's just, <laughs> there's, well, I have some, there's something I know. Well, I'll, well it's they horrible. actually believe that this, these, the books that they're walking around trying to give people are actually being disseminated by like God himself through their, their agents at the, uh, the Watchtower Society, whoever the heads are that, that write that stuff. I mean, were you aware of that? I was not because the only thing I knew that the Watchtower put out was magazines. Yeah, but they but everything that's in there, there's that that comes direct down. They believe it's like being directly disseminated. Like when all oh, those people come on here and go, yeah. thus say it the Lord. That's <laughs> that's what they believe. Yeah. Um no, I yeah, you I didn't know, know what that you're talking huh? about. No, well, I know what you're talking about now. Okay. Um uh -huh. I didn't think that they treated it like scripture <laughs> oh no and above actually that's just kind of crazy which is just like the book of mormon so they have their own edition and uh but anyway sister angel what were you gonna say i was just gonna note that um well so i've known two people who have been like like i, I mean i've known other Je uh, like in passing than other jehovah's witnesses but the two people that i've actually known closely who are former Jehovah's Witnesses or who were raised in it, they were both sexually abused, like in a group setting by the, by their church. Wow. Uh, okay. By the King Paul. Yeah. And also, and then there was like horrible, like abuse escape, like craziness, you know, with, with both these people, but also um, the friend of mine that I mentioned here a lot, my friend who that I grew up with and who, you know, she, her, she was born into this bloodline family and they did all this weird, you know, ritual abuse stuff to her and programming and all that stuff. She, she was only ever in assigned relationships, like the people she would be uh, married to, because she was married multiple times or dating. They were, they were fellow travelers in that, like they, they, and I don't know that they knew that, you know, she wasn't like conscious of it until, you know, she started figuring this stuff out, but like they were kind of assignments, you know, that, that, that handlers would kind of put them together because you can't really have people like that dating outsiders because as soon as they start to live with them i mean like they could those these people to find out all kinds of stuff so they they try to keep them together managing each other right so her husband uh, jake was uh not only was he a jehovah's witness raised jehovah's witness uh he was raised in the watchtower cult like high like in watchtower like i guess it's like you know a bit of a there's like it's like i don't know i i, I think of it like the, as the vatican versus the you know just a catholic church you know like it like these satellite churches i don't know how like if they have like the watchtower headquarters i just know that he was uh uh his mother was part of the watchtower cult like not not just as Elvis witness and he was ritually abused and programmed and his father was a satanist like a satanist biker this whole time like while they were married and like so but she was in the watchtower cult and um i just found that you know to be really uh really interesting because that's that was how he got kind of uh, shuttled in to this to this like world that these people oper people operate in, where they're you know pairing off you know their kids with you know other people that are in, involved in these things, trying to keep I don't know it's like they're trying to manage everything to keep people from it's like a big secret, right? So it, it just seems strange to me though that because like whereas you know my friend was raised just basically a Luciferian. It was just as well to get someone from the Watchtower call to be her assigned, you know, relationship. You see what I'm saying? It was like uh, that wasn't uh, considered, he wasn't considered an outsider. He was, I, I never got all the details. I just know he figured out that he had had all this stuff done to him before she ever did. 
before either of us ever did. And he like wrote an entire album about basically trying to tell her what was going on. And we did not realize that that's what the songs were about until like, we figured out later and I went back and listened to this album that he wrote. He was kind of internet famous. If you look up Benjamin Bear on the internet, that was like his uh, weird little rap name, right? And he was like a white rapper guy, but he wrote this whole album about trying to tell her what her family and his family were involved in. Kind of like coded, but it, it totally makes sense. And so I don't know if Watchtower, like the actual cult, has like a specific headquarters, like where they like, you know, like uh, declare. They do. they do. Where is it? Yeah. I don't know offhand, like, but they do. Right. Okay. Because like, I don't I remember right now. In California, but, it. but yeah, but I thought it was really crazy too that, you know, my ex, uh, my, my ex's sister, you know, she was she was raised in Je the Jehovah's Witness call, and she just has a horrible story about, you know, the the whatever you call them, their pastors. I don't know what you call them, but like leading, you know, abuse sessions for the for the girls, and her mother being complicit and like offering her up to. And it, this was just like run of the mill like sexual abuse stuff, but you know, not not like the weirder stuff I was just talking about with my other friend, but. Uh, so that doesn't bode well for me all automatically, but I don't know that I'm not saying every Jehovah's Witness is involved in this at all. But um, uh, I have never seen a happy child who was a Jehovah's Witness. All the Jehovah's Witnesses that I oh my goodness, knew, they're just so uh, forlorn and morose. It's so sad. You're so right. I when I was growing up, there was a gentleman that was across the street that was a Jehovah Witness, and my dad, um, they he befriended him. And they used to work out together in the garage and stuff. And, you know, he would try to, you know, disseminate the truth to him to bring him out of that because that stuff is, they are a cult. And uh, his son, he had a son. His son, they, he was so strict with him. That little boy was the saddest child I ever saw in my mm -hmm. life. So when you said that, Hang I, their head I, down. That yes. Was Serious, oh, yeah. he couldn't like, like we'd have to go over and he could only play at certain times and certain mm -hmm. a certain day of the Stress. week and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. On their shoulders. Yep. It was it. really, really heavy on him. He was so sad. I used to I, I felt so sorry for him because I never saw that child smile. Yep. That's what I was just thinking. I could never saw Kyla, the girl that I went to school with, who was like the Jehovah's Witness when I was you know a little kid. Man, she never. She was a very pretty girl. Could have been like a supermodel. Never smiled. She was so downcast. And, and I saw her once. Like her parents were like making her get clothes from like the free bin, you know, like where people just like mm -hmm. dump clothes, like in one of those. And I don't think they were poor, but like it was like a weekend, and I saw her like it was like she was it was embarrassed. They were sitting in the car, and she was digging clothes out of that that free donation bin. And I don't think it's because they didn't have money. I, I got the distinct impression it was like this. They didn't they didn't buy her clothes. Mm -hmm. They they wouldn't even do that because like you know I don't know I guess they thought they were spoiling her. That was the impression I got, and I felt pretty bad too. It was like after that I felt bad that everybody would make fun of how she would dress, you mm -hmm. know, because she would wear stuff that didn't quite fit her and stuff. And uh, yeah, the, the fact that you knew exactly what I was saying, what I meant, I, I don't think it's. Mm -hmm. uh, like a one-off. I'm sure that there are no. some. Parents yeah, I knew one. Uh, yeah, go I on. A, yeah, I knew a kid as well that it was a uh, Jehovah's Witness, and and uh, yes, very sad and aloof. Um, and you know, it's it, they don't celebrate birthdays, and every time there was like something at school where we have like a you know, we'd celebrate a holiday or whatever, they would have to be you know dismissed. I mean, it just they they singled they singled out from an early age. Also from um uh uh. Uh, what's the other, what's the other religion you mentioned? Uh, uh, Mormons, Mormons. Yes. Um, they, uh, that, first of all, there's a lot of, uh, that's, there's a lot of tie in with Freemasonry. They have a lot of Freemasonic overtones or undertones, uh, and practices. And, um, and they also, uh, oh, the, 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 the other thing that in their scriptures too, they have a lot, like a lot of personages, peoples and places that are anachronistic, like, they have like people like Abraham appearing in like you know different times like a thousand years later than he really actually existed, uh, and they'll name like like kings or you know great empires that never existed. 
it, it just person persons and places and things that never existed. And so it's provably false. It's just it's just ridiculous that anyone believes it. I also uh, thank you, Ben. You you actually kind of stole my thunder on what my surprise was. I wanted to drop on Jordan here about some of the connections to Freemasonry and these false religions um, uh, and leaders of these uh, false religions. But uh, Angel had mentioned where was the headquarter for Jehovah Witnesses. According to an internet search here, real quick, it's First Kings Drive, Tuxedo Park, New York, is where the world headquarters of the Jehovah Witnesses are. Uh, Jordan, were you finished? I, I know we interrupted you here, but I want to make sure I let you finish before we go to break. Uh, I I wasn't, but I can. No, that's fine. It. That's fine. We've got about 10 more minutes here. I'd like you to continue. And then I'm going to interrupt you so we can go to break and we'll come back and we'll let you finish uh, your presentation. So please continue. Okay. Yeah. I'll just use this to wrap up on the Jehovah Witnesses then real quick. Um, so... Uh, and just so we know, that way when we come back to break, I'll tie it together right now. Um, so there is a link between the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses because uh, Charles was actually an Adventist himself. And uh, we'll we'll see more about what the Millerites, Seventh-day Adventists, believed here. Um, but let's see here. I, I wanted to go through their plan of salvation. Uh, basically, how do you get into heaven? So... They, you have to believe Jesus was the sacrifice for your sin. You have to learn what the Bible, quote unquote, really teaches. Then you have to repent. Are we shocked that we saw this one coming? <laughs> that is that we need to feel a deep sorrow and stop practicing sin or practicing anything that would offend God, which you guys are getting into as far as the holidays, birthdays, and all that. Um, and then you have to get baptized and endure to the end. Now, the New World Translation, this was the only thing that I thought they felt was inspired like that. So I'm glad you brought up what you did about the Watchtower um, publications. But the Watchtower Society actually published their New Testament in 1950 and their Old Testament in 1961. And the funny thing is, you guys won't even find this on Bible Gateway. <laughs> um, but I wanted to pull up just a couple things real quick. I'm going to try to just breeze through this quickly. First of all, looking at their New World Translation of John 1, 1, you know, where it says in the beginning, the world, uh, or I'm sorry, in the beginning, the word was, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. A God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they also got some flack for jo uh, Job 6, 6. I'm not sure if you guys know this, but they revised it in 2013 because in our version, uh, it says, can that which is unsavory be beaten without salt, or is there any taste in the white of an egg? And their version says, will tasteless things be eaten without salt, or is there any taste in the slimy juice of a marshmallow? So, <laughs> uh. but they're obviously infamous for using Like I said, anachronistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and real quick while you're laughing... The it's just a footnote here, which is why I hate these modern Gnostic blasphemous heretical damnable translations. I'm not talking about the people that use them. I'm talking about those books. The NIV is almost indistinguishable from the New World Translation. Just so you know. Go ahead, Jordan. Yeah. So that was just to give you guys uh, uh, the another huge one um, because we know that um, what it says about Jesus. Um, they Say instead of using um, Jesus as sitting on the throne, or I'm so sorry, now I got like completely jumbled, but basically the fact that Jesus is sitting on the throne next to the Father, they'll say that God is your throne. Um, and another thing they believe is they believe Jesus cre or God created Jesus and Jesus created everything. So just going over that real quickly. The other thing is they're very against the cross. They believe in what was called the torture pole. And the problem here is they don't see a difference between the Roman Empire and the Romanian Empire, which was done by Vladimir. Um, but if just check out some of these verses like Colossians 2.14 in the New World Translation. Just there's a complete dismissal of history of the Roman cross. Um, but 
every little cult has their little pet arguments, but again, they also don't believe in hell. They believe in annihilationism. Yep. Um, let's see here. The, oh, the big one, the 144,000, the quote unquote little flock, completely ignoring the fact that this is tied to the Jewish tribes. Um, but all I have to say about the name that they, that was the point I was trying to make, uh, Jehovah. Um, that name in our version is actually only used four times. And mm -hmm. they went back and replaced it all throughout. And they actually, um, like in the sections of our King James Bible, where it would be capitalized in all Lord, you'll see those um, translated as Jehovah. But that's essentially my thoughts on the Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses. Um, those are the two big ones that that were born out of the 1800s that are still alive today that are just okay let's stop right there because i'm sure you have some more you want to continue with and i don't want you to start a new one or, or or more information if you've concluded about that are you are you done with that with the job yeah is? okay cool we're going to come back after break we're going to let mr jordan continue here and then we're going to have angel's topic which is about the antichrist and the temple but before we go to break i wanted to get some scripture in here because jordan had mentioned this and i wanted to read through this quickly i don't think it's going to take very long it's ephesians chapter 4. okay so i'm going to read it real quick here therefore i, I want to read it because in context this is going to show and elucidate about these false doctrines and i think you'll appreciate it Ephesians 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all loneliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fit, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that she henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the, under, their, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth 
is in Jesus, that she put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that she put on the new man, which is after God, which after God is created in the righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Beloved, we're going to come back right after the break, right here on Late Night with Lisa and friends and continue our discussion and expose of these false ways that originated and popped up in the 1800s as Jordan is uh, showing us that these what we would call Christian in parentheses you know or uh, what it yeah what are the quotation marks in quotation marks Christian they have a Christian flavoring, but they're not true. They deny the truth. They deny the soul sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. They deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they insert all these other uh, things that you have to do to be saved because it's based on works. We're going to come back and discuss that further right after the break here on Late Night with Lisa and Friends. I hope to see you on the flip side. Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Um, thank you for staying with us and coming back to join us on the back side of this break here on Late Night with Lisa and Friends. Uh, I'm going to let Jordan go ahead and jump right in. There's something he wanted to address that was going on in the chat. So, Jordan, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, so we have a new friend here in the chat who is inquiring uh, about salvation, but also had a couple of other questions. And um, one thing I want to answer is because it sounds like you almost have like a fear of your sin, which, you know, that's healthy to have. Um, and you're kind of inquiring about, you know, whether your sin is too great, it seems like. The one thing that I want to say just from the get go is your sin is there regardless. So what do you have to lose by receiving Christ as your savior, who is the only atonement for your sin? Um, I know you brought up the fact that in James 2, it says faith without works is dead. And I know that is something that a lot of people use to promote a works-based gospel. But just touching on it real quickly, because I don't want to digress completely. Um, sorry, I had so many Reese's Pieces during the break and now I'm hiccuping. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But um, basically, James 2 is essentially saying that your faith, if it is not profiting somebody in the church or somebody on the street, like, what good is it? Like, is faith alone going to help your a, a homeless man that you're walking down the street? No. For that reason, faith without works is dead. A person can see you justified by your works, but God sees you justified through your heart. So the question becomes, how do you become justified? So just letting you know, um, your fear of sin and falling into sin is completely understandable. We all have to come to that point. Sometimes we need to realize that our sin is so severe that it can lead us to the point where we will be eternally separated from God because God cannot stand in the sight of unholiness or wickedness or anything that is in betrayal to his covenant. And so that eternal separation is hell. But the thing that is so magnificent about our God is that he loved us so much that he became man. And that man's name was Jesus Christ. And Jesus lived a 
perfect and sinless life, a life that you and I could never live. And in doing so, he became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And the things that Jesus endured, he didn't just die. He was tortured because of his love for you. He was mocked, ridiculed, beaten, spat on. And these were by the people who he loved most, who were constantly following him up until his crucifixion. They just days prior, they were saying Hosanna. Um, and then, you know, he was whipped to the point where his flesh came off. A crown of thorns was crushed into his skull. And he, he was forced to carry the cross that he would eventually be nailed to. And he did that all out of love for you. He did that all so you would not have to die and be tortured for your sin. So when Jesus died and then rose again, he conquered sin and death. Now all he is asking you is to trust in him. He says, will you believe me? Will you believe what I did was enough to save you? Will you come home? And that's all you have to do is respond in faith and say, yes, I choose you. There is nothing I can do. And it already sounds like you're at that point. You realize there is nothing you can do. And you say, Jesus, there is nothing I can do. Please save me. And he will. Now, with your second concern of can I lose my salvation? I'm going to still struggle with sin. Whoever is telling you that they are a born-again Christian and they are not sinning, they are either deceiving you or they are deceived themselves. There is not a single person who does not still struggle in some way with sin. Now, it's by the grace of God that we have the power to overcome sin, but that walk is going to look different for everybody it's going to be a lot easier to stop lying than it is for someone to, to stop heroin. You know, everybody's going to look different. You can't compare your discipleship journey uh, with somebody else's. Even Jesus's own disciples, we saw such a difference in how they all were in terms of their spiritual maturity and their faithfulness. And the thing is, in order to become a disciple, you first must be justified. So don't think that God's afraid of your sin. Don't think that there's a sin that you committed that's too big to be forgiven. And the thing is, when we are saved, we are eternally secure. This is not to be confused with a license to sin, and I'll go there in a minute, but I want to explain what happens when you place your trust in Jesus Christ. This is why we are eternally secure, because when we place that trust, essentially a trade takes place. I don't really like using that term, but it's the most simple way that I can describe it. In this trade, we take on Jesus's righteousness. It's called imputed righteousness, and Jesus takes on our sin. So God is able to see us as blameless, as if we live the life of Jesus, because that is now imputed onto our account and since we are under grace, we are no longer under the law. And since we are no longer under the law, there is no more transgression written to our account, meaning there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Because when God looks at us, he sees the seed of God inside of him, which is the Holy Spirit of promise, which acts as a down payment for our inheritance. When you look at that Greek word, that down payment is, um, it insinuates that the transaction must be complete by the person who started the transaction. And he seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of deliverance. And that seal lets the world know, it lets the devil know, it lets the heavens know. We are a purchased possession of Jesus Christ. We are bought with his blood. Do you really think there is a single power in this universe that has the ability to come and steal something from God? Absolutely not. Part of what also happens is your heart is circumcised from your flesh. That means you are cut off from the consequences and the penalty that takes place in your flesh. Your flesh is still going to die because your flesh will still desire sin because your flesh still has a fallen nature. The difference is you now have a spirit. Your spirit doesn't desire sin at all. Your flesh desires sin all the time. So now your 
soul is in between wrestling with these two things it's now confronted with. But when you rest in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, it's then that you have the power to overcome sin. Not when you're constantly worrying about, am I going to sin? Because I'll tell you what, I tripped myself up so many times when I was worrying about sinning. But the moment I just rested in Jesus, so much was lifted off of me. And the final thing I want to bring up that happens when you place your trust in Jesus Christ is you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. What that means is you then become part of what the term is ecclesia, which means the called out ones, or more commonly known as the church. The church is not a building. It is not confined into four worlds four walls. It is the assembly of believers in the name of Jesus Christ. We here tonight, we are the church. And I just plead with you that you take all this into consideration and that you do put your full trust in Jesus Christ and realize he He bought you. He paid for you. He just asked that you trust in him and you will be saved. And there's such a beauty in that and there is such a peace that overcomes you and there it's nothing there's nothing like it being part of the family of God and knowing that you're destined for glory regardless of what happens in your life now I don't want that to be confused with the license of sin because just taking it to a personal level real quick when I dived into a lifestyle sin it left me homeless jobless and carless and it It really brings a lot of destruction in our lives, and it can ruin our testimony. It can bring all sorts of complications. Um, It's just, it's still not something to have in our lives. And people who look at grace and then say, woohoo, I can sin, it just, it doesn't make sense to me when you actually think about everything that Jesus did. I wear a cross every single day that's made out of three nails, because anytime I tempted to sin, I just hold on to that. And I think about everything that he went through. And I'm like, is this worth it? Is this fleeting moment of pleasure? Is this moment of deceitfulness to get out of trouble? Is any of this worth it after everything he did for me? And the beauty is the grace will sustain you through those temptations. And as you grow in Christ, those temptations will start to Uh, decrease, but do not beat yourself up because you feel like you're still struggling with sin. We all do, and we will until the day we die in our delivered to glory. He just simply asks that you trust and rest in him. Amen, Jordan. Thank you so very much for that. Would you like to give out your contact information for this gentleman so he can contact you? Oh, yeah. Great call. Um, If you want to actually let me just type it in the chat for you. But okay. it, if if anybody who's listening to this back or anything wants to reach out to me, my email is revivalist with an S at the end for Christ at Gmail dot com. Not trying to plug my own channel. I swear the only thing you have to tune into is that intro video. I also do a gospel presentation, which is only five minutes long. Actually, Lisa has it on this channel as well. So. You can even watch it on this channel. Um, But just take a listen to that too. And just remember the promise that you have in Jesus Christ and know that he died for you. He wants you. Do not let your fear of sin or consequence keep you. Because like I said, what do you have to lose? You're going to be with sin, whether you're saved or not. So what do you have to lose by giving it all to Jesus? Amen. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate that. Thank you so very much. Okay. Getting back to our topic um, tonight, which was dealing with these false, heretical, blasphemous faux, because they're not Christian at all, faux Christian offshoots. Um, Jordan, I wanted you to be able to continue where you left off. We left off talking about Jehovah Witnesses. I wanted to make sure you concluded your thought on that before you moved on to the next one. I did, yes. Okay. Um, just real quick, um, before I hop into that, because it looks like 
I'm, I don't even want to attempt to say his name and say that's mm-hmm. wrong, but he said, well, in that case, I want to accept Christ today. So I just want to take a moment and if we could all oh, yeah. join in prayer. Um, but definitely my friend, you are making the right decision and you are, your life is about to transform and you are going to feel such peace. Please reach out to me. We can zoom call this week. We can do whatever to make sure that we have all your questions answered. Also, I would start in the book of John. Um, I think that is a wonderful book, um, for new believers. So, but dear heavenly father, we just want to thank you that your grace shines once again in these online ministries. We thank you for bringing another brother home. We just praise you for all that you do, your merciful mercifulness, and as well as your willingness to use us as a vessel. Who are we, Lord, to even be used by you? And we just thank you for reaching out to your new son in Christ and just opening his heart and giving him ears to hear. We thank you for his humility that he was willing to see the severity of his sins and realize what it is that he needed to accomplish that freedom from sin. And it's not what he can accomplish, but it's all about what you accomplish. And we just pray, Lord, as he goes into Resurrection Sunday tomorrow, that he will even fully understand more. And what a beautiful time to be saved. (laughs) And <laughs> at the crack of dawn on Resurrection Sunday, what a beautiful, beautiful testament. Wow. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Amazing. Praise you, Jesus. Jesus. I'm what sorry, was Sister that? Angel, what were you going to say? I said God's doing big things lately. There's been a lot of stuff going around. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. According to the Bible, the host of heaven, heaven is rejoicing right now for you. Uh Uh-huh. It's a party. (laughs) (laughs) Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we love it. It's just so funny because look at how many people, the easy believers, are (laughs) getting in contact with this week. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I know what we got another one. <laughs> they trust Jesus all the way. We they trust them. They're trusting Jesus completely. The angel <laughs> Little do they up. know. Uh, yes. <laughs> so there is a conspiracy. There is a godly conspiracy, as I've said before. The Lord is not on a search and destroy mission. He is on mm-hmm. a search and rescue mission. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Really. That's why he yeah. won't he doesn't let you screw it up once you once he's got you in the bag <laughs> or in the life. You know he doesn't we like will. give you Yeah. Yeah, he's not going to give you that would be such a headache for him. Imagine if you just had to keep running around recollecting the same people over and over again every time they fall out of the lifeboat because because they could screw it up themselves. No, that's not how he's going to do it. He wants, he's got a lot of people to worry about. He's going to, he's going to snatch you up and, and make sure there's nothing you can do to, 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 to change that outcome. So he doesn't have the headache of having to go. What, how many times would he have to, I mean, it's not even yes. rational to imagine being able to go in and out of salvation and lose it and not even yeah. know it's, but, but let's just say if that were like, imagine, God like designing that kind of headache for himself. <laughs> I know he wants to be. A, no, it's settled. That's just like a he straight jackets you in terms of your ability to do anything for your salvation. That's it. You're like, straight jacketed, put in a padded room, and you're sitting there until <laughs> and you know in terms of your salvation. Obviously, that's not what it's like to be saved, but that's how much he it, like uh, has to prevent you from being able to screw up. His perfect a, uh, plan of salvation. <laughs> I want to make Ben work. Ben, while I while I say this quote, would you pull, please pull up? Uh, what is it? Is it Matthew ten twenty eight? Could you? I want you to read that where he can see that he is secured not only in Jesus but in the Father also. Um, and then I want to say something that ought to make a lot of people mad because I like. Uh, using quotes no matter what controversy is behind the person that said it if it's a true statement which Charles Haddon Spurgeon said if it should ever come to pass that saints of God could fall away alas my fickle feeble soul would fall 10,000 times a day 
So uh, we all know, those of us who understand eternal security and understand who Jesus is and what he has truly done, not what's been misrepresented by like a lot of these false religions we're talking about tonight. We know we cannot be lost. As the Gospel of John, the 17th chapter says, he says that everyone that the Father has given him, he has lost none but the son of perdition, which was Judas Iscariot. He's not going to lose one of us. He is preserving all of us until the day of redemption. Ben, could you read that scripture, please, if you're ready? Yeah, it's actually John 10, 28 John, to 29. John, okay, thank you. Yeah, John 10, 28 to 29 says, and I give them, this is Jesus speaking, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. So you see there, uh, you're, you're, you're clenched in two different hands, a, a double double protected the son is protecting you and the father's protecting you nothing Amen. no one can snatch you out and i want to make sure you understand because people will do this mess they'll say well yeah uh you you can't be removed but uh you can remove yourself what did he say he said no man can remove you that means you yourself cannot be removed from his hand by yourself. Even if you were to go, I'm mad at you, God. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to play with you anymore and walk away, which a lot of people have done. They get mad at God for whatever reason. They were praying and some prayer they wanted for a loved one they truly loved. Maybe they passed away and they get mad at God. They put the blame in the wrong place. They blame God. And then they say, I don't want to do nothing with you, God, anymore. If they were saved, they're still saved. But, you know, don't listen to people that tell you that. You are eternally secure in him. He is the head of all principality and power, and he has declared. This is not a promise from just some prophet. He's more than a prophet. He is God manifested in the flesh, and it's an immutable fact that he cannot lie. Okay, uh, Brother Jordan, I'd like you to continue, uh, and I'm yep. sure the chat, it, it, it will take care of him if he needs any further ministering to. We got a lot of... Uh, firm believers in the Lord Jesus Christ out there that can can help him. I want you to continue with uh, exposing these false religions. So please go ahead. Yeah, apparently I'm really ticking the devil off tonight because I got kicked, but <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> so I guess where we will pick it up is the uh, Church of Christ, which is the one that I had been involved with myself. Now, with the Church of Christ, you guys need to remember, first of all, it's so sad that I have to say this, but if any church has the word of Christ in it, I would do a lot of research. It is so sad and sick that I even have to say that. I, I can't believe it, but it's just a sad realization. But these people, these are your Campbellites, which we'll get into, but they identify as the Church of Christ, the International Church of Christ. Um, the International Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, the United, Christ, uh, United Church of Christ, or the Christian Church, um, which is very interesting because this is a group of people that says we do not believe in divisions, but this is only seven of their divisions. <laughs> so anyway, um, this is really the peak of the restoration movement. When you think of the restoration movement, this is who you think of. And this is um, a result of the Stone Campbell movement. Stone was the brother uh, or brother-in-law of Alexander Campbell, uh, who was an excommunicated Baptist, <laughs> um, which is funny because this is also the group that will preach baptismal regeneration, which we will get into, but they themselves did not practice baptismal regeneration until 1822. Um, just, I, I'll go into my short testimony with them real quick. Uh, here in a bit but basically they say you are lost unless you have obeyed the gospel which means you must do the will of god those who obey not are punished and um, those who are obey are free you have to be in the lord's church now here's the thing they think they are the lord's church and all others outside of them are damned and they say christ died for the church which he did just not the church of christ in that sense um and then the saved are added to the church. 
and then Christ is the savior of the church. And then you are in Christ. Um, these are all things that we believe too. Um, but we'll see here how their plan of salvation differs uh, because it's all about becoming a quote unquote faithful Christian. So they have a nine step process of obeying the gospel. First of all, there's God's part, which is God sent his son, Jesus shed his blood, the spirit was revealed to the world. That's it. God's part's done. Now it's our part. We need to hear the gospel, believe the gospel, repent of our sins, confess faith. We need to be water baptized and then remain faithful. This is how serious it is, guys. When I asked, there's a kid that I just talked to. Again, this was the church that screamed at me a couple of weeks ago because they lost their hopeful convert because I just, even though it was three verses one, it was very easy to shut them down. And the thing is, when I asked one of their members, let me ask you this, do you trust in Jesus wholeheartedly? And he said, yeah. And then I said, okay, so if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, and then on your car ride to your water baptism, you died in a car crash, would you go to heaven or hell? And his answer was, I don't know. Then I said, then you're not trusting in Jesus Christ. It's just so sad. They mix the salvation with their discipleship. They mix what Christ did and what we are supposed to do. There is no assurance about, um, there is no assurance in the salvation. It's not about him. It's all about us. And that's just mixed up theology because we know that it's all about him. That's why he gets all the glory. And to make it three steps for God, six steps for men, who's getting the glory there? And this either creates a spirit of pride or a spirit of condemnation. And just so you guys know, like the Church of Christ is pretty prevalent in society like your duck dynasty characters those are your church of christ people and look at how influential they are even to this day their show's not on anymore but sadie roberts she's out there i love her to death i, I feel so bad talking trash about her i love her so much but <laughs> she doesn't follow proper doctrine their own grandfather just had a meeting with um i don't know what they're called they're the people who are like right under the Pope, uh, flew out and talked to them. It's just, it, it's such a, uh, so many celebrities are involved with the Church of Christ. It's either them or the Scientology, but we're going to stick on them. So the whole idea here is they view the new, that the New Testament was not Jesus Christ. They view that Jesus Christ bought, brought in a new set of laws. And these laws include water baptism. You must attend church. You must be baptized by a member of that church. You must partake in the Lord's Supper every week or you are no longer part of the church. Um, and then you're not allowed to worship with musical instruments. Like, first of all, all you restored there was not the New Testament church. You just restored Romanism to, and took away their musical instruments. Second of all, this whole thing about musical instruments, they're like, oh, no, that's a sin. And they misconstrue a couple of verses to make their case. And they say, the, you, you can't aid to your worship. Okay, well, then you need to get rid of your pews. You need to get rid of your projectors. You need to get rid of your hymnals. You also need to get rid of that pitch pipe that you use because that's technically a musical instrument. Um, but all it is, is legalism. They often go to Matthew 7, 21 and 23, and they'll actually say these words. They'll say Jesus was a legalist. And then right below that, they'll have Matthew 7, 21 through 23, which is complete misuse. And it's actually talking about them. It's those people who see now I feel like I have to say something about that real quick because now we have a babe in Christ and I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to throw him off. Um basically with Matthew 7 21. Let me just open it up real quick. Cause this is one my new friend that they will throw out at you. So I just want to go ahead and equip you real quick with that since we're talking about it. Uh Matthew 7 21, 7 21. Okay, perfect. So Looking at 7, 21 through 23, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in 
thy name have cast out many devils, in thy name done many works, and then I will profess in them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Please email me if you have further questions beyond this. I'm just going to do a brief rundown just so you know what this is talking about. The will of the Father is to believe on Jesus Christ, therefore if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you are not saved, so therefore Jesus cannot know you. It does not say that I knew you at one point and you lost your salvation. It says I never knew you. And you can't say that it's because they weren't doing good works because tell me the last time you um, cast out a devil because I never have. So they were doing good works too. It's their good works did not save them. So that's a very, very brief rundown of that verse, but please reach out to me. Don't let people misconstrue that. So um, it really is just a religion of no assurance versus perfect assurance. The just given a brief rundown of um, my testimony and a pair, um, my work with the Church of Christ. When I was in Tampa, Florida, I had an encounter with them. They said, you want to come to a Bible study? I said, yeah, I definitely want to go to a Bible study because this wasn't a season of my life where I feel I had drifted from the Lord. Thank God I was saved or else it would have been very easy to be deceived. Um because they're very good at what they do. They have this workbook that they work from, which they don't tell you about. They just tell you it's a, a Bible study, but it's literally a probing of you, your life, and um, a rewashing of your belief system. And I found the workbook online. It's crazy. I was like, wow, I did this Bible study to a T, this quote unquote Bible study. And the thing is, they will do this sin study before they bring you into their theology. And to me, I don't have anything to back it up from experience, but my belief is the reason why they do the sin study there is so if you decide that, no, I'm not going to be part of this church, they have things to frame you about because they go deep. They go really deep. They, they talk about, did you ever sexually abuse anyone? Did you murder anyone? And they're like saying this with a straight face. I'm like, how would I be sitting here if I murdered someone? Like, I'm only 29. Like, I'd still be in prison. Like, it just doesn't make sense. But, so, to me, I think they just use that to frame themselves. Getting around to it, basically, when I found out about their baptism, regeneration, I said, oh, well, I was baptized. And the thing is, guys, they'll misquote all sorts of verses, too. They'll use Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, 1 Peter 3, 21. I'm working on a whole thing right now that breaking all those down but it's just anything that subtracts from what jesus did and adds your works of any kind to it is um just not it, it's not the correct gospel and a quick way to refute them um you know titus 3 5 says we're not saved by works of righteousness but when jesus is baptized he calls baptism a work of righteousness uh, in Acts 10, the Gentiles, which, by the way, the Holy Spirit was received seven ways in the New Testament. Six of those ways were for the Jews. One of those ways for the Gentiles. They responded in faith alone in Acts 10, were saved before they were baptized. That's just a quick way to debunk them. But getting back to my story real quick. So I told them that I was baptized and then they went on this whole spiel about how I had to be baptized by a member of their church and nothing was sitting right. And I said, well, then can I be baptized tonight? And they said, I don't know if you're ready. And I'm like, who are you to play God? <laughs> and this, I'm glad it happened because it really sparked my whole like, wow, we all don't believe the same thing about the Bible. And it's a huge reason why I have this ministry today is to put these heretics in check. So that's them. The last group that I'm going to talk about is the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, this is found by Ellen G. White, the quote-unquote prophetess. They emphasize a lot on biblical prophecy as well as diet and education. Uh, the thing is, most people don't realize how much the Seventh-day Adventists um, influence um, our world today with uh, hospitals, universities, televisions. Uh, they also bring members in through prophecy seminars, vegetarian cooking, and no smoking classes, but they don't have their name attached. Um, but the thing is... Very Ellen, common. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like there are a lot of historical inconsistencies as well as pro 
false prophecies. And this is what I was going to bring up with the Jehovah Witnesses. This man, Mil William Miller, he uh, had a following called the Millerites and predicted that Jesus would come in 1843. And then when that failed, he predicted 1844. And this is what's called the Great Disappointment. And the Great Disappointment is basically all these people just ended up in a complete state of emotional distraught when Jesus did not come. Um, and so with Ellen, <laughs> instead of admitting she was wrong, she claimed to have a vision from God. And this is what she said. I have seen that the, oh, and by the way, all my notes completely crashed um, when my computer did that thing. So I don't have everything pulled up that I was originally going to pull. Um, but I do have this quote written down. So she claimed to have a vision. So I have seen that an 1843 charge was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake. She said God hid a mistake that he made in some of the figures. And for the Seventh-day Adventists who may be what, watching the back, oh, no, you're misquoting her. She never said that. Um, go to Early Writings, page 74. It's right there. Uh, she also married a man by the name of James White. Do with that what you will. Um, but the Bible also warns against the quote-unquote false prophets. Um, well, I shouldn't say quote-unquote. They are false prophets. <laughs> I'm, I'm just really in the mode of saying quote-unquote because I'm quoting all these heretics. <laughs> um, but their ministry is so focused on the second coming of Jesus. But we know that some of her prophecies, just to give you an idea of um, what she predicted that have not happened. Well, first of all, Jesus would come while she was living. Uh, Jerusalem would no longer stand, even though that's been being built up since, what, what, 1940? Something like that. We just came across a big anniversary for them. Um, also, in 1862, that was supposed to be the downfall of the U.S., so clearly she did not know what she was talking about. To give you an idea of some of the visions she had, uh, some of her visions, she actually had a meeting with Enoch. She traveled through different worlds with wings, and she had a gold ticket to get in and out of heaven to speak with angels. She was also very racist, which is another common theme we are seeing in these cults. Um, she said that uh, people who are of color are a crossbreed between animals and humans. There was also this thing called the Midnight Cry, and those are who rejected Miller's movement, which thus the Seventh-day Adventists, the whole Advent movement. They had these what they call shut the door verses which are just quotes they use from Ellen White because she was the prophet of this religion. And many of them will claim that Ellen White is not on par with scripture, but she is. Um, but let me see here. Where was I going? I just said something. Oh, Midnight Cry. <laughs> the shut the door verses basically are for those who reject Seventh-day Adventists. They basically say you are not you are no longer saved and you cannot be saved. Even if you decide to come back, you're gone. So it's a real big scare tactic. Then they also have the doctrine of investigative judgment, which basically says there is an angel assigned to each of us that is tracking every move we make and we will be held accountable for wasted moments. So if we do anything leisurely, that is a sin and it will be taken accounted for. I don't have it in front of me anymore because my computer literally crashed. So my apologies, but um, they have what's called the Clear Word Bible, which was published in 1994, which was just a way of supporting Ellen White's um, theology. I have Daniel 814 written down. I don't know what... Well, I had it pulled up in front of me. I don't know why I had that written down. So just go and search Clear Word Bible, Daniel 814, and pull up your regular version of the Bible. Um, but I know in Daniel 9, she added 300 words to that chapter alone. Um, they also came out with a study Bible, which is just notes from Ellen White um, all throughout the Bible. She also demisses how, which is a this is what we see in all these cults. They just dismiss the severity of hell. It's either annihilationism. It's either it 
not eternal. There's just, there's something. And it's all to diminish the severity of it. Um, they also believe in soul sleep. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with that doctrine, basically, we will all be asleep until raised by uh, the spirit. Uh, but here's the funny part. So Ellen White, actually, all these quote unquote revelations from God could actually be traced to other materials that were written. Only 20, less than 20% of things that she wrote were original context. The rest were plagiarized. And a lot of the visions that she had were actually from images in these same books, like actual illustrations that were made. Um, but also, you know, being a Victorian woman, she was very big on decreasing men's sex drive. And, uh, this is where a lot of her dietitian restrictions came out. Um, you'll notice that Seventh-day Adventists, a lot of people will convert to that religion just because of the health parts of it. And, um, basically their belief is if you're not a vegetarian, um, you won't be raptured. So, um, I'm trying to see here real quick, because I do have a couple of notes written down, um, because I don't want to forget to say anything before I get into the Sabbath. Um, but, oh, this is huge. Okay, so this is something, um, sh this is, I don't have a direct quote in front of me anymore. I'm sorry, so I'm going to butcher it, but if anybody decides to come against me and say I'm misquoting her, I will find that quote again. But she basically said that we are not to rest in the thought of being saved, that those who say I am saved are basically deceived. And those who think that they can just get into heaven by faith alone aren't saved. No one is saved because um, Basically, she believes that if you transgress the law in any way, you are just not saved. And so getting into the big thing now, the Seventh-day Adventists believe the Sabbath, uh, we need to observe the Sabbath. And it's so sad to me that people don't see that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. The whole idea of we are not supposed to work on the Sabbath means that once we are saved in Jesus, no works are required. They don't see that correlation. So they'll say that anyone who is attending church on Sunday rather than observing the Saturday Sabbath has willingly take the mark of the beast, creating a separating wall between them and false believers. It's the greatest test of loyalty, and they call this the seal of God, not the Holy Spirit. The seal of God is your observance of the Sabbath, because if you are not observing the Sabbath, you are intentionally taking a rebellion mark. So those are those two, like, briefly ran down. Um, so yeah, that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> No, no, I was about to add just how many, um, like, so-called Christian truthers, quote-unquote, they will be either, like, Church of Christ or especially SDA, Seventh-day Adventist. Mm -hmm. There's nice, no no coincidence there, but they don't, like, advertise it. Mm -hmm. that you, you find out it got another SDA in the woodpile eventually. Like, oh, he's SDA. <laughs> like, they don't, they're very hush-hush about it. Um, you know, I can think of one, but I even like, like, I think he's like a really nice person. I don't think he's being sneaky, but like his name is like, he calls himself Adventist Hermes Justin Wilson on YouTube. Really sweet guy. Like, I, I don't think he's being sneaky. I think he really believes. I, I can't even imagine that he actually knows that it, that some of the stuff that they teach, like when you said that she, Ellen uh, White believes if you transgress the law in any way whatsoever, you're not saved. Like, I, I, I can think of so many SDAs that would probably say no that's not true that's not true at all because I don't ever really hear them hammering on law but it's like they present one thing and like believe another and they don't really like evangelize they just tell you not to not to worship on mm -hmm. on Sunday like they don't really like try to I have I've I've seen like that's their evangelism it's about this Sunday thing but not about like let me also show you all the other ways that you need to be corrected. Like if they don't, if they don't think you're saved or it's very strange, but mm -hmm. the, the United, or the, the church of Christ, like I, that was the place that I was taken once when I was 
pin when I spent the night at a girl's house and they made me go to church the next morning when I learned about like the mark of the beast and all of this stuff and like the big grand conspiracy like uh uh paradigm that I really feel like was presented to us like so that we would we would have certain expectations about how revelation would play out and all that stuff like it's like just kind of like oh it's the chip or all of these things uh I heard that in the church of Christ and I've never heard another Christian talking about what they were talking about which now is so common um not, not, I'm not saying that it, like fundamentally it's something wrong but I just felt like that was interesting that that they are a very charismatic in terms of like, they'll grab you as something that seems really true. Cause I never forgot that day, even though I was an mm. atheist and I was very bitter and resentful. I knew when I was in that church, like now I'm not saying that all of their interpretations about how it's going to play out are accurate, but somehow like I knew that, that like this revelation thing was going to come true. Like that this is true. Like that, that like that was real. And it hit me really hard. Like I, was not I couldn't believe that the day that I was taken it they just so happened to be preaching on like the most heavy thing imaginable but like it it stuck with me and if that's like you know besides the things you described about how they which by the way the whole like have you ever committed murder thing just because you committed murder doesn't mean that you were convicted they probably really expect that you would tell them about a murder you committed that that you hadn't been caught for you Guys, know what I mean like that's angel yeah. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. Okay. You didn't know this because you don't have um, chat because she's on her phone. Yeah. But Jim the Atheist came back into our chat tonight. Oh, and yeah. he said that his heart is ready to hear about Jesus. And he wants oh, to wow. know what he has to do from this point forward. Since you are former, our former resident atheist, can you please speak to him? Yes, Jim. I mean, well... <laughs> There is no doing when it comes to to actually being safe. It's really about um, this moment of realization when you realize that Christ did what he said he did and that what that means is, is that if, once you've acknowledged this, basically just that you've accept, like acknowledged the truth about like this whole situation that basically God, he fixed it for us preemptively before we were born. He took care of it, you know, uh, at the cross with Jesus, once we once we really actually believe that <laughs> we're saved, that's all you have to do. Now, as it as to like what you need still to like understand in order for you to be like absolutely sure that that's correct, that, that that's actually the ultimate reality of all things. That's a different story. But there's no doing involved. It's it's something that happens in your heart. I can't say for sure when I got saved I don't have like a date because it was like this process of like realizing that the bible was true over like a week period primarily and um I just know the night that I spent all night just talking to God crying my heart out in a way that I, I can't even describe not in a sad way but just remorse like realizing wow you've been like reasonable this whole time that I have uh, disrespected you and doubted you and been bitter and resentful uh, toward you, even though I claim not to believe in you. And you've, you've been there. You've been in my corner the whole time and you get it. Like you get everything. You get every part of me that nobody else could ever get. And you, and you love things about me that uh, no one else in the whole world even knows are there. And it's so personal that's something that was so moving to me. And so I feel like I don't know exactly when I quote unquote got saved because I also always was told the true gospel, like as a, as a, you know, with my family, because they were believers and it was the correct gospel of eternal security. So realizing the Bible was true was the big part that I needed to piece together. Cause as soon as I did that, I knew that the, the Bible said <laughs> believing on Jesus is what saves and that once you're saved, it's, it's a done deal. There's no going back no matter what you what even if you want to, it's done. Um, so that was an easy part for me because really it was about being convinced the Bible was the word of God. And once I did that, it was kind of automatic because I, I, I didn't even realize other people, except maybe Catholics kind of, <laughs> I didn't totally understand that anybody else thought differently about what what salvation was or what the gospel was but um i just like anything that uh, any of us can do any questions you have 
any kind of like roadblocks where you're just like, yeah, but this still doesn't make sense to me. Uh, please uh, let us okay. know because those we can we can get you through those things too. Angel, he just stated in the yeah. chat. This is what he said. I believe with my heart that Jesus died on the cross for me, and that I am a sinner. Yeah, it's really it's really that simple. That you believe he, he died on the cross for you, and what what did that accomplish? It accomplished you you now uh, have his vicarious righteousness on your account, and so when God looks at you in terms of salvation, in terms of where you stand legally. He sees the perfection that was Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. And um, you <laughs> to, to, to hold you accountable would be double jeopardy. You cannot suffer the eternal consequences in terms of heaven or hell for your sins. You're you're with God forever. You um you're guaranteed the happy ending. The 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 happy ending that like we just inherently all long for as people um, from the day that we can, you know, form our first memory, you know. That's that's what we're really looking for, and, and you know, because I hear people say they believe that Jesus died for them, and I think it's even more important. Like, so what did that death accomplish? Because that was the part I didn't understand, even as a kid with a family of true believers. I didn't understand that part, and um, uh, that is just a huge step, though, considering where we were last week. But I knew oh, there was a two weeks ago. Now you were honest, though. Like you had a humble heart. You, you you weren't just trying to win arguments. You were being very genuine. And so I, I wasn't really worried about you once, once I realized that because I know what God can do with a heart like that. It's really getting them to that point. That's, that's the, all the battle is when, when he gets you to that point where you're, you're honest with yourself um, and, you're, and you really just want to know the truth, even if you're still angry and, and – uh, resentful and confused it's just that it's like a humility that's it's uh it's not a work that's required for salvation but it's a it's a fertile ground for salvation to occur and so i saw that in you and i um i had i had a good feeling about where that was going to lead i think we all did so it's just amazing that you're here and amazing that you actually you know chose to to, to work all of this out uh, and let us let us participate in that and and the chat like you did it so publicly and it's it's just really I got another kind of amazing move of God that we've seen in the past couple of weeks um, and I love it I, I am sure other people have something to say too because we were all extremely touched by oh, Jim's yeah. situation I had told him I had been praying for him the last several days since he was in the chat before because I kept checking my email to see if he had contacted me so I could forward it to you as promised so he could ask right. whatever questions he wanted and I hadn't received it. So when he came in the chat just now a little while ago, <laughs> uh, I, my heart leapt. I was like, oh, praise goes. God. He came back. And then, you know, he's listening and he says it. he understands. It makes sense. His heart is ready. So. Um, who wants to lead him in prayer to, uh, oh, to Christ? Yeah. Says his heart's ready. This is a formality, but it's a it's a good thing. It's a it's a it, it's it's helpful. We we don't want you to think the prayer is what saves. Right. The, yeah, absolutely. That, that conclusion you're arriving at right now. But uh, yeah, somebody else who's better at that than me, uh, Lisa, perhaps, <laughs> or Jordan. <laughs> ben and I are not the best. When I go for that. <laughs> <laughs> I Jordan, can lead in I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot, Jordan. I've worked hard <laughs> enough tonight. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, most definitely. Um, I think it's just amazing to see because yeah, I was just asking you the other night, Lisa, when we were on call. I'm like, have you heard from him? Like, it's really been he's been on all of our minds all week. So this is just so amazing. But you know, so, I wasn't worried because I I felt like I just had this. I don't know if it's something God told God kind of gave me peace of, like I, I knew I knew he was gonna be okay I knew he was gonna he was gonna get it I just knew in my heart like I wouldn't have been worried to find out he hadn't emailed you for I know that sounds bad but I just had this weird feeling about uh about the point he was at uh when we talked about so but yes please go ahead Jordan because uh, this is so awesome I feel like I'm gonna cry right now so oh me too don't get me started <laughs> all right well again Heavenly Father second time we're coming to you tonight with 
a safe soul. Like, why? Why us, Father? I mean, it's all about you. And we just thank you for letting us use um, or be used as a vessel by you, Lord. We lift our new brother Jim up to you, Lord. We know that he is coming with so much religious pain, so much trauma. He's bringing so much to the table. And he's saying, I trust you, Lord. It's all about what you did. It's not about what I went through. It's about what you did. And now, Lord, we pray that your will be done. We pray that you take those injuries and you turn them into battle scars and you make him a fierce warrior Mm -hmm. for you, Lord. Fierce warrior. We pray, Lord, that even if things don't just fall off naturally, that we will start to see his pain subside and forgiveness forgiveness abound in his life. We know a concern of his last week. He said that he could never love or forgive his enemies, Lord. But we, I, I, don't, I know me and I'm sure others on this panel and I'm sure others in the chat have been to the point where we said that there is no way we can forgive them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. They hurt I us. I didn't even pressure us. myself to do it either, but eventually just find yourself asking. Yeah. Doing mm-hmm. it. <laughs> and so, Lord, we know that you can deliver us from all pains, hurts, anxieties, everything. So we pray that the enemy will not shackle him down with these burdens that he once was exposed to by a false religion who claimed your name and trained him to hate your name we are so glad that you brought him to the point of repentance we are so glad that he is trusting solely in your life death burial and resurrection which we are celebrating today lord resurrection sunday your glory is shining oh, wow. <laughs> your wow. glory is so magnificent lord and we just pray that jim will feel the need if with these new inquiries where to start what questions need answered that he will reach out to any of us and that he will continue to tune in to this fellowship lord we just pray that you will strengthen him and that you will just help him grow in his faith because we know that the enemy is so angry at us tonight, Lord. But we know heaven yeah. is rejoicing. Uh, I can't even oh, imagine what's happening in heaven right now because <laughs> you know we just feel it in our hearts and it's just like, man, I could do black backflips. But Lord, so we sorry. praise you and thank you. We thank you for our new brother in Christ, and we just pray that you will nourish him up with the milk and help us be able to move him onto the meat. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, that was so beautiful. Yeah, you know, it's, um, wow, this is really moving. I, but, you know, I, I just, it's like we have a new baby in the house. We have just, I just got done thinking about that, like when you called the, the baby in Christ in uh in the chat and I realized how moving that is when some when you have a newborn baby it's like it's, it's almost you can't wrap your head around it mm-hmm. and I just think back to what that that what tra- that point the transition <laughs> that you know my uh salvation marked in my life like how things have changed since then and, and the peace that I have it's not we're like we're none of that listen I'm gonna curse here but uh, we all know we ain't shit all right this isn't about like wow we're so glorious that we're saved forever because we're just that great we can do nothing to go to hell because we're so awesome it's not it's that that's how awesome God is we're mm. just that confident in his kindness his love and his mercy and his per- perfect justice and fairness that he would not have like the Bible would look nothing like it does if there were some way that we could screw our screw ourselves up out of out of salvation once we when you know when the Bible it appears to say you have to just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right over and over again. Uh, that's how good God is. He's just he is his mercy is limitless and his um and, and you and the more you walk with him. And I don't mean like in a holy, pious way. I say walk, like you're living your life, acknowledging that he's there and you, he's like literally watching you. He's in, he's in it with you every day. That's what I call, you know, what I mean, I say when I walk with God, it's just, it's just my relationship with him. Right. And, and I tried, there's, there's no doubt in my mind. It's a hundred percent real. It's not my imagination. 
because I was never the type that could have imagined God was real. I, I didn't, I couldn't understand how other people could really believe God was real, right? Consciously, because I think subconsciously I always knew. Because you don't get angry at somebody, you don't think it's real. I've never been mad at the tooth fairy. I don't care at all about the tooth fairy, you know? <laughs> Only time I was ever mad about something like that was when I realized that my parents lied to me about Santa when I did my sting operation at four years old. Uh, five, I guess five years old when I stayed up and watched them all day. But I've never been mad at an imaginary figure. I don't actually take it <laughs> seriously. So, you know, um, I'm so excited for you because I know <laughs> – I know what it is to, to be lost and to not know for sure the truth of anything and to think there is no way to know the truth of anything. Ultimately, ultimate truth, I mean, where any of us end up or what any of it is for. And I'm just so, so happy for you because your, your, your burden is about to be lightened, Jim. It's a, it's a night and day difference once you really know God and you really know uh, that he loves you enough that he's like going to all of those, the deepest, darkest fears that we have, especially as yeah. atheists, Amen. That he, none of those will ever come true. I, I could see a demon in my room as I'm going to sleep. I was just talking about this and rebuke in the name of Jesus and just go right back. It's like, it's not even and, a big deal. And anymore. you weren't a believer yet, right? You weren't a believer well, at the time when you said the first time you did that? The first time, yes. Now, I did not roll yeah. over and go back to sleep. I was awake. But <laughs> now, it, it, as a believer, uh, which this was like, this crippled my whole life, is this mm -hmm. fear, even as a child, of things going bump in the night and, you know, even specifically demons. <laughs> and I had sleep paralysis, too. And I had no trust in anything. So it was just terror with no like mm -hmm. no way out and no, no, no comfort at all. No answers. And the idea that I could genuinely not even question, but be certain that a demon of some sort was attempting to put me in a state of sleep paralysis. And then I just called on the name of Jesus and it stopped. And then I just roll over and go back to sleep like that. I could never fathom that kind of peace and confidence because <laughs> mm -hmm. that's really scary if you think about it. And that's what I have now. Because the fears that we have about everything else in life, especially when they become so crippling that we're just miserable all the time, the real fear is the fear of knowing you're going to die someday and you don't know where you're going or if you're going anywhere or if, if it meant anything at all. That's where the real fear is. It mm -hmm. augments and exacerbates everything else we experience in life, especially mm -hmm. the our generation and the, the modern unbelieving person we're just basket cases and it keeps getting worse because it it, it, it rots your your sanity like at least a hundred years ago uh, people were lost but they generally had the sense to know well enough that, like, that there was a god right so they were mm -hmm. starting off a little bit more sane in terms of their worldview and how they understood mm -hmm. things and we see the further we get away from that point it's just chaos people are are, are useless and broken when they're, you know, like, like around my age, or, you know, Gen X millennials and, and under, it's just, there's, there, cause they have no foundation and the foundation that they do have is, is just lies and sand and it crumbles at the slightest challenge and, mm -hmm. and it never comforts them as they lay down to go to sleep and that not really, not really. And so they, what they do, they take pills, you know, most of them now <laughs> they, they knock themselves out of drugs mm -hmm. because, um, what else? That is the logical thing to do when you don't think God is real. I, I truly believe that in a world, the way we see it now, it's perfectly logical to just take to take pills and drugs and just numb yourself until your inevitable meaningless death. You know, if that's the really way the way you see things. Mm. Um, and so that's what they're doing, and um, it's a it's a sea change. Just this moment and. God's going to have so many little things in store for you where you're going to realize like you were really always there. You really do know me and you're like a best friend and a dad, but times a million better than anybody could ever imagine, like all rolled into one and, and so much more. Um, and it's not imaginary. It's actually real. And he'll show you that in the, just the exact ways that, that you will understand. I can't even fathom how he'll do it, but I know he does it for all of us. And uh, I'm just so excited. I'm just so excited for that. And I'm just so relieved for you, Jim. 
Yeah, I wanted to read something real quick, and then uh, I want to give you your opportunity, Angel, to talk about your subject tonight. Um, Jim said uh, to me, directed at me for the most high, thank you. I appreciate you. I want to apologize to you and the panel last week if I came across as arrogant and prideful. I was just angry at my abuser. Uh, Jim, I already knew that, sweetie, um, because as I said before, no, nobody rages against the Easter Bunny. So if you're mad, pe a lot of atheists don't process this when they're hostile, clenched fists towards God, that you're not, you, how can you be angry at something that doesn't exist? They don't go together. And so I always try to get, that's why I always ask them, what are you mad about? What, why are you angry at God? <laughs> because, well, I don't believe God exists, then why are you angry? They don't go together. So, um, you, you know, you, you're already forgiven. I, I never held it against you for a second because I already knew there was anger there for a reason. And then when you started being honest about what you were angry at and we showed you that it wasn't the Lord that allowed that to happen to you and he did not want that to happen to you. We're in a fallen, broken world with broken and evil men who, when they're not submitted to Christ and, and don't have faith in him, even if they cloak themselves in his name and they're going to be held accountable for that mess too. Uh, and they can do evil, but they're doing it in his name, but it's not him. He has nothing to do with it. It's a lie. And so I'm glad you were able to hear us and listen to that and, 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 and let the Lord minister to you because the Bible says no man can come to uh, the father unless the Holy spirit draws him. So you were drawn by the Holy spirit. He saw your broken heart and he wanted to mend it. And the Lord oh, will yeah. mend it. Even if it hasn't happened yet, it will. Okay? So, we we all have had our hearts mended in one way or another from <laughs> some form of brokenness that we had growing up or living life in this fallen world. You're not alone. Okay. Uh -huh. so and, please, and you know what? This For the part of you that's vengeful, this is the best revenge you could get <laughs> on the people that would, that would cloak themselves in the word of God. Uh, and yeah, the, the children intentionally so that they will absolutely the devil did not want you here. He did not want no, no devil in hell could stop you from making a decision for Christ. So uh, we thank the Lord for you. We thank the Lord that you came back and we thank the Lord for your continued healing and blessing and growth in Christ. And we know that will happen. Uh, stay connected to Christ. Get into his word. You have Jordan's contact information. You have mine. Please do reach out to us. We want to make sure that you're you're properly discipled and grow in in faith. And that will happen. Praise the Lord in Jesus name. We're going to be praying for you too the whole way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sister Angel, we're getting to you, girl, with your topic tonight. This one, oh, I know we had a full a broadcast tonight. To what's happened oh. already. Oh, it does. <laughs> it does. It's nothing more important than what just happened with Jim. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. But I did want to give you your opportunity to speak on it. Um, right. <laughs> what is your topic tonight for, for our listeners? Well, so it was kind of like a two-fold topic, but I think we'll just do the first like it wasn't really they weren't like two connected things there's just two things I was going to talk about but um I will I think this will be perfect because it's, it's probably be brief because you and I already worked it out when we were talking that night but I recently was very disturbed because I I had watched a channel called on point preparedness who uh he has uh he used to subscribe to uh to me I know at least to me and so that means he's seen our show and stuff and he has very clearly, like, uh, been inspired by things, uh, like, almost verbatim that Ben has said, and he would cover it on his show next after we talked about it. So I know he watches, so I'm hoping he hears this. Um, he has me blocked on his channel for some reason. Uh, he does not believe in eternal security. So, um, but, you know, uh, I don't know, some of you might remember the, the, the talk Ben gave on, like, the idea of spiritual nakedness. Well, wouldn't you know it, like, within just a few short days after that broadcast, which was a very strange subject, this guy did a whole, like, hour or something long talk on just, you know, <laughs> poorly mimicked thing that, that Ben had the exact, you know, very unique, insightful things Ben was saying that day. Now, he has recently said that he believes that it, the proof that we can lose our salvation is the fact 
that the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God and declare himself to be God. And that the Bible specifically says the temple of God, meaning uh, the body of a believer, like that our, our bodies as believers are the temple of God. And so if the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple of God, it must mean he is going to replace the Holy Spirit in us. And only believers, are, you know, in his argument, count as the temple of God, right? Only our bodies. It's not, not a lost person is the temple of God because they don't have the Holy Spirit. This is what he argues. And it was clever. <laughs> Honestly, it was clever because I knew it was wrong. I just didn't know exactly why it was wrong at first. And I can only imagine the people he's shaking <laughs> with this because he also didn't go into it very much. He just kind of broached that the, the subject and said about as much as I've said to you. And he just kind of dismissively like kind of like, you know, all poor people, poor, poor OSAS believers. They're going to get really upset when they hear this, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, this is a divisive t subject, but as if he just had a slam dunk argument that proved that once for all, that of course we can lose our salvation if, if saved believers are going to be indwelled with the Antichrist, if that's the abomination of desolation. So I wanted to talk about that. Um, and I, I really wanted to hear Ben's thoughts on it, especially because, um, he is just so, he is so well studied. He's like, he like slices and dices a lot of stuff from scripture where he's just got it all. He literally has like a, a vast notebook like on his computer, like notes. So just crazy amounts of, of research he's done. And I was, I was curious what he had to say, especially considering this channel uh, uh, did an homage to his, <laughs> to his, uh, to his observations on like spiritual nakedness uh, not too long ago. And <laughs> You know, now now he's coming out uh, with with this, which I hadn't ever heard anybody else really claim directly as proof that eternal security was not true. Um, but me and Lisa had discovered, you know, a multitude of problems with with his, you know, with what he was implying or, you know, even directly stating uh, the ramifications of what he's saying and, and how crazy it is. But I want to hear everybody's initial thoughts uh, on this idea before we go before I go any further. Everybody's well, mic uh, is broken. No, uh, I mean, one thing, okay. Well, one thing I'll say is uh, just to kind of tee this off a little bit. I guess uh, I I presented this uh, on Renee, at least uh, Renee's channel uh, Thursday, and I I actually uh, shared it with you at one point, um, Angel too. But I yeah. found some more uh, clues that I thought were fascinating, and um, there's a uh, like I said. Uh, uh, there, in 780, uh, roughly 700 AD, Sargon II, there was Sargon I, Sargon II is, I guess, his son. Um, actually, I don't think it was son, his son. I think they were separated by a few thousand, a few hundred years. Um, but anyway, Sargon II, uh, who, who is really interesting, by the way, he also, one one of the, in addition to the thing I'm, I'm going to share here in a second, he also claimed that he was rescued um he was put in a uh, a basket, uh, a tar covered basket, and floated in down the river. And he was rescued by rescued and adopted uh, by a by a priestess. Uh, so there's a lot of similarities with uh, Moses' story, but there's one here that I think is fascinating, and I, I I'm not I, I don't see anyone make this connection, and I think it's very uh, very significant. It doesn't necessarily it kind of tangentially touches on the subject you talk about angel but um i i just gonna read it here real quick it's, it's a cylinder seal uh of sargon 2 and it says in the month of abu the month of the desert of the re god destroyer growing cultivated vegetation when one lays the foundation platform so that foundation platform keyword for the city and house the other keyword i laid its foundation wall walls another keyword uh I built its brickwork. Uh, again, I built it. He, he's the builder, you know. He he is the br bricklayer. Um, that's what the Freemasons believe in. And I, I see a lot of. I, I believe you know Nimrod, Sargon. I think uh, these are all uh, uh, types of shadows for the Antichrist throughout history. Uh, and what's really interesting about Sargon too is that if you look at at him, uh, he's got a, there's a statue of him. I think the only existing uh, like bust of his face. One of the one of his eyes is like busted out, like and again the Bible talks about the uh, the idle shepherd with, with the darkened eye, 
Uh, we know what you know. We love all well, the, uh, the Hollywood celebrities love to do the funny things with their eye. Anyhow, um, continuing on here, it says the wall I built is brick brickwork. Substan substantial shrines as the foundation of eternity I constructed therein. And these are names of gods: A S Sin and Ningal, Adad, Shamash, Urta. Places of ivory, mulberry, cedar, cypress, juniper, and pistachio wood. So those are six precious things, so to speak. I built uh, at their lofty command for my royal dwelling place. Again, dwelling place, city, house. These are all terms for a temple. A bit Hilani, a copy of the Hittite Syrian palace I erected in front of their doors. So again, doors is the equivalent, the equivalent for synonym to doors would be gates. Beams of cedar and cypress I laid, o laid over them for the roofs. 16,283 cubits, the numeral of my name. I made the circuit or measure of its wall, establishing the foundation platform upon the bedrock of the high mountain. Now, I color code, I'm showing this on YouTube right now, and I sent you, Angel, uh, a copy as well, um, of, of areas of correspondence with, with Revelation. Where Revelation talks about, so again, so our guy's talking about he's building a temple and a city for himself. Um, and these same words uh, are used in Revelation 21, where it says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Again, so our guy talked about high mountain and showed me the great city. Again, the city, the house, holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven, having the glory of God. Her light was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall, here's that word wall, and 12 gates, again, gates and doors, and 12 angels at the gates, and the names on them, uh, which are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So, again, these are glorified entities, if you will, uh, the tribe, 12 tribes of Israel, or the 12 apostles, whereas uh, Sargon, uh, he names his gods. He, he uh, and there's aspects of his construction or temple the that that uh, you know um play uh, pay homage or not homage but uh have a, have a uh a memorial if you will for for something that's uh deified or uh, uh glorified um he says now the wall this is again in revelation now the wall of the city had 12 foundations there's that word foundation again and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb and he who took talked with me had a gold reed measure to measure the city. So again, measuring, uh, very precise measurements. Uh, you see Sargon, he had 16,283 cubits. Again, very precise measurements. And it was based on the numeral of his name, whatever that means. And again, continuing on God here in Revelation, he says, uh, the city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as his breadth and the measured. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs its length breadth and height are equal then he measured its wall 144 cubits according to the measure of a man again that's very similar to numeral of a man it says according to the measure of a man that is an angel and i, I think we said there that is an angel i'm thinking that might be like a, the angel of the lord that's alluded that this that the old testament refers to so it's really the measure of a man it's, it's christ um because again, we know that he is the cornerstone, uh, and that you know he's he's the uh, he's the keystone, the cornerstone uh, that the builders rejected. And so it says the construction wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall in the city were adorned with precious stones. And here's there's twelve precious stones. And again, what's interesting? These are precious stones. They can't be burned up by fire. Whereas Sargon. All his things were perishable in the fire. There were all trees or bushes, uh, types of wood. There's ivory. I guess that's, I mean, I think that's that's really just, you know, it's like our, our cucumber, our uh, toenails and fingernails are made of the same material as ivory. So it's, it's perishable. Um, but the New Jerusalem, again, these were, it was outfitted or adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second was sapphire. The third was chalk. Sidoni, uh, Chalcedony, I don't know. Uh, the fourth, uh, Emerald, the fifth, Sardonyx, the sixth, Sard Sardius, the seventh, 
chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth the topaz, the tenth uh, chrysoprase, uh, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were the twelve pearls. Each interval gate was of the pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent, transparent glass. And again, so it, I, I, so this I believe again is a, uh, to, to, in, in Revelation, it's basically uh, the kingdom of heaven coming down uh, onto earth. It's the it's the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, who's referred to as our mother uh, for believers. It's coming down, descending from heaven, I believe. Um, again, it's in Revelation here. It's, but in, but in, we know it elsewhere in Corinthians. So this is actually a, a physical building. But in, in 2 Corinthians also, it says, or do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and who, and you are not your own? And also in Ephesians 2, 19-22, it says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So, uh, again, uh, from a spiritual perspective, uh, uh, the 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 human body is the is the abode of of God. Um, but there's also an aspect uh, where He will uh, when, when He comes to Earth, when He when He come, I believe in the in the millennium when He comes down when He. Uh, when he uh, is physically residing on the earth, there's going to be a temple as well, and uh, and so there is. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've kind of lost my thought. So, anyways, the one thing about the mark of the beast, you know, again, I believe it's basically saying it's basically the ultimate blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. These people, they because they uh, it says in Thessalonians because they uh, did not want to believe the truth, they did not receive the love of the truth. The love of God. They did not receive it. They rejected it uh, because they uh, rejected that. Because they rejected the truth. Again, law principle. It boomerangs back on you. They will believe the lie. They won't believe the truth, but they will believe the lie. God sends them a strong delusion, and I believe that's uh, all part of the mark of the beast. And essentially, uh, again, it's, it's putting your number on His temple, just like God seals believers uh, in the spirit. Uh, Satan. Uh, again, who's after the flesh, the earthly, he, they, he uh, puts his mark in their flesh. And uh, and again, so you see that the numeral of the name. Um, and again, that's part of uh, both the, the spiritual aspect and the earthly aspect. And some people, one thing I, I think is interesting is that with regards to what this individual is saying on prep preparedness, uh, some people uh, have a real hard problem. And I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, you know, I understand why they have this problem. They have this problem uh, is that they don't believe that the uh, that Ezekiel, because I believe Ezekiel talks about a, 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 a millennial temple being built, and it includes animal sacrifices. And a lot, a lot, a lot of people have a really hard problem with that, saying, "Why do we need animal sacrifices? This must be allegor allegory, or it must uh, be something else." But I don't believe. I believe if you read the account in Ezekiel, it's very detailed, just like the law of Moses was in the building of the tabernacle that he built uh, and the temple of Solomon. So it's very exacting in his details. And and I re I believe essentially why is there animal sacrifices in the millennium on that millennium temple? I believe it's um it's not it's not for the forgiveness of sins, but the, it's a, it's a uh, it's an aspect of the theocracy essentially that. That it's going to be uh, in, when Christ, I believe, in the millennium, it, it, the whole earth is going to be a theocracy, and the millennial sac sacrifices uh, don't simp simply memorialize uh, Christ's redemption, but they primarily function um, like uh, in restoring and maintaining the new covenant Israel in in theocratic, theocratic harmony. So, uh, just as we, as believers, um, we take part of the Lord's Supper. We don't. It, it's not. This could take part of the Lord's work. It's not like we're crucifying Christ all over again. No, we're doing it in memorial. It's it's a memorial, and I believe that's exactly what's going to happen in the millennium. There will be animal sacrifices again. The temple in Ezekiel is very detailed, um, and I believe that will be built. And I believe that's the temple that the Antichrist will enter into. 
But again, it's before Christ even sets foot in it. So I don't know how anyone could say uh, that's that's proof positive that a, a believer can be demon possessed. Because again, it's before Christ even puts it, sets foot into it. He calls it his temple in the sense that yes, that's the temple he'll he'll be in when he during the millennium, where he kind of rules and reigns. But these these uh. The, the, if you study the the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament, there there were much more than always than just forgiving uh, sins. It was about ceremonial cl- cleanliness. Um, so it's like a sanctification. Um, so I, I believe again for Israel for that purpose, it, it is like the ultimate manifestation of the the fulfillment, the the complete fulfillment of the old covenant. Because Christ said, not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law until. Uh, uh, until heaven, until heaven and earth are passed away, this current present, earth, heaven and earth pass away. Not one jot or tittle will, by any means, be uh, removed from the law. And I, again, I believe this uh, uh, temple, this earthly temple, uh, in the millennium, is going to be that ultimate manifestation. I believe personally. I know a lot of people have the problem with this, but I believe uh, the law of Moses is uh, well. It's really, it's not really law of Moses. It's actually amplified higher. I believe the earth is going to be uh, ruled by essentially uh, the Mosaic law, essentially. Now, it's not going to be called the Mosaic law, but it's 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 the ultimate fulfillment of that. And I believe that's why people are going to so, be so, because um, it talks about at the, at the end of a thousand years, people are going to rise up again and rebel against God. There's going to be a great war and Satan's going to be loosed and he's going to, they're going to lead them to battle with the with, you know, God, God and his, his people. And I believe that the the the, the institution of the law, uh, a strict adherence to the law, is going to you know it's going to make people ripe for rebellion. They're going to hate it. They're going to think it's, it's it, God's a tyrant. Um, now again, people like us who are going to be redeemed and born again and have new bodies and perfectly righteous. We won't have any problem with the law. But again, it doesn't mean. And again, the law doesn't mean that. Uh, I'm not saying it's exact Mosaic law. I'm just saying it's a it's a like a kingdom version of that law. Anyhow, you could disagree or agree with that. I guess all I'm saying is that um, I believe that temple is what that temple is for, and I don't think anyone is going to enter into it. Uh, I mean, God's not going to enter it, and then uh, Antichrist is going to enter it, and he's going to push him out of there. That's ridiculous. No, it's a temple that that it, the Jews of, I believe, in the tribulation time will start putting up, possibly sooner than that, but uh, it's it's designated for Christ. Uh, for them to fin- finally receive their rightful Messiah, but the Antichrist will step in first. But it's before Christ steps in, so I don't know how anyone could say that. Um, you know that that's good evidence for that. I said a lot. So and plus we know, and plus we know, like um, it's not that Christ just has no use for this temple. He's that he's going to clean the temple. He's going to cleanse the right. temple again. So the the idea that it's just like this this silly like empty gesture that I, I mean you know. That nothing will come of it like this this physical temple that people say well yeah they might build a temple but it doesn't mean anything it's just like for show it's just you know it's not the actual temple of god i think that's like a and that's that's just that that's a whole other level of refutation that lisa and i uh we had didn't even discuss when we were talking about it uh on the phone uh, on Friday. So that's, that's just, that's an added bonus. That's amazing. That's a really good point. And it's funny because I, my phone just randomly decided, I don't even know where, what website it was. Cause I was out gardening where I had my earbud in put on this uh, Bible study today, something like Maranatha something. And I, I don't know how I got there or what website it was on. It was just, my phone was in my pocket and it did this. And it was a, it was a whole, like uh, he, he went over not this exact subject, but basically the idea of um, about the temple, about it having a, a use that, it, you know, and the idea of sacrifices being reinstituted in the millennial reign and the fact that, you know, Christ isn't like that, uh, that the, the temple is, you know, that it gets built here on earth, you know, Christ is actually going to, to, uh, to, to take possession of it. And I didn't completely connect the dots with the subject tonight, but it's just funny because it's like not a coincidence that that, that uh, randomly started playing on my phone. I have never, I've never heard of this person or I don't know what he looked like. I never actually looked at my phone, but it's just so funny that this is exactly what you lay out <laughs> here tonight about, um, about the, you know, in, in regards to this question. So, but I want to hear yeah. what anybody else has to say. Oh, go on, Ben. Well, I was just going to say, um, 
Again, I, I had a I had a real problem with the Ezekiel Temple. I just said I, I can't I can't just throw it away because it's, it's difficult to deal with. But I, I then I started realizing, okay, th- how do I know? I don't think it's the sacrifice are for the forgiveness of sins. There was so much more with regards to the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament. And mm-hmm. again, Christ said. I think that one of the key things again, Christ said, not one shot or tittle will by any means be. Um, you know, lifted from the law until heaven and earth pass away. And so until this earth is recreated, this heaven and earth are recreated, the the, the, God, the law is in effect, essentially. God's law is in effect. In, in, in other words, judgment, people, it's subject to judgment. The curse, it's subject to the curse uh, because it's under, uh, under, under the law, essentially. It's under the curse of the law. And, uh, and so I, I believe a millennial temple, a millennial reign is basically like the ultimate fulfillment it's it's almost like okay, God has tested man through every different uh, set of scenarios. Like there again, there's age of innocence, uh, age of self governance. You could go all, all into this stuff, but um, the age of the law. And I think it's this is the it would be the age to show, it's the final age to show man, even with the ultimate uh, lawgiver in their presence. You know, even 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 in a perfect um, under. Basically, to show man that he's a flop and a failure, he's unredeemable. Even with the perfect example, uh, ruling and reigning uh, in the world, unrighteousness will still be a problem because man is unrighteous. And so, uh, until the new heaven and earth are, are created and we are born again, there's no need for a law because you only put under the law that which is right unrighteous. In fact, Timothy, Paul said to Timothy, the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Uh, but it's not for a righteous person. It's for, and then he goes into uh, liars, uh, poor mongers, thieves. And then he, at the very end of it, he says, and any such thing that's not according to sound doctrine, which I thought was so awesome because it was one of those, that that particular verse for me was one of those verses that once I started, th- I, I realized, okay, it's definitely, a, a, you know, law and grace don't mix whatsoever. I fully understand what the law is now. I fully understand what grace is now. And then once I did, I could, all these weird verses that made no sense and no one else could under, could explain them that I, I could get satisfactory answers for suddenly made so much sense. Like I said, the law is not made for the, uh, a righteous person, but the unlaw, the uh, you know, the law, the, the liar, the coward, the thief, whatever. And because again, the law identifies fault; it's a fault finding thing. Where grace doesn't find fault, love doesn't find fault, doesn't remember faults. Um, but uh, in another, in another verse too, was, was do not. Uh, boil a kid in his mother's milk. And I was like, what does that mean? No one could I, I come up with an answer. And I realized milk is the it's mother's grace to the child. So you're, you're, you're spurning grace by boiling the kid in the milk. And I can see totally that's what a cult would do. The cult does that. They, they, you know, spit on Christ. They blaspheme Christ. They hate grace. Um, and so, uh, I just thought it was really fascinating, and I and again I think again I have there's a, a couple good documents I found uh, a research once by John Whitcomb. It's called Christ's Atonement and Animal Fi- Animal Sacrifices in Israel. And he talks about um, he talks about the different uh, uh, you know, he, he says basically here's the introduction. He says how does the atoning work of Jesus Christ Christ relate to animal sacrifices which God gave to Israel through Moses? What did the blood of these animals accomplish? For believing and unbelieving Israelites during the days of the old old covenant theocracy, how does the old covenant sacrificial sacrificial system compare with the new covenant system envisioned in Ezekiel forty through forty eight and other Old Testament prophets, especially in light of the new of the New Testament Hebrews? And it's a free paper. It's a what? It's a PDF. I'll put a link in it on the, in the chat. But it's excellent. I mean, it goes over all the different aspects of the law, and again. Animal sacrifices uh, were not just for forgiveness of sins. It was for uh, ceremonial cleanliness or purity. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And that was one Thank of the first you. conversations we had, too, about boiling kids in the milk. Well, I think mm-hmm. you and I talked about that once on the show and how yeah. we both had come to that conclusion. Thank you for that, Ben. I have to – I was – doing a lot of chat while you were uh, talking. So I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to this segment of the broadcast to hear everything that you were elucidating. I did catch some things, very interesting uh, things that you showed us right there in the scriptures. Thank you so very much for that. So um, I like the way your mind works and how you look at stuff. I wouldn't be able to do that. That's why I'm like, you know, 
I'm always blown away whenever you show us these things and the way that you bring it up and show us these connections in the scripture. And I truly do appreciate it. And I'm sorry that somebody is <laughs> ripping you off and then and then uh, like it, it actually flipping it to twist to twist it. You know, um, these people are something else. But Sister Angel, have you uh, finished, sweetheart, with what else you wanted to talk about with uh, the connection to the Antichrist? And um, well, yeah, yeah, because you know what, uh, Ben's uh, argument, because I know you and I discussed was basically that even if, even if you know, we're, the, the temple being discussed was the human, you know, was the uh, was supposed to be the body of the believer. Like we we were talking about how. Um, the human body itself was, you know, it's not act just like God. It was an afterthought that he decided that was going to be the temple that he would sit in in terms in a spiritual sense. Um, he th that was what, you know, the human body was always designed to be the temple of God, you know, in, in terms of uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That was, you know, he, he had a plan the whole time. It wasn't like he just retrofitted it. There's a skunk in my garage. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I never have walked up on a skunk like that before. Um, but anyway, uh, but it, it, you know, Ben kind of rendered uh, what we had talked about kind of moot because um, it, that was just a tertiary argument compared to his, his point, which is that there is going to be a physical temple uh, to which the verse refers, and it will actually be the temple of God because Christ will uh, make use of it. That, that is where he is going to reign from. And you know what's yeah, interesting? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I was going to say, um, okay, so we know we know that – I'll just put th more things together here. We know that on the spot. I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, we know that um, believers are uh, the temple of God. The church is the temple of God. And I believe the in, in Ezekiel, uh, the, the, in, the, in the millennium, there will be a, a – a that's a temple as well. But uh, what's interesting is – so so in other words, uh, God, you know, God, is, God has a people as a temple, and he has a, has a physical building as a temple. And I think why not? Why wouldn't Satan do the same thing? He's going to have his temple, so to speak, physical temple uh, that he's going to try to claim. You know, he's going to step in and say, "I'm God," and he's going to believers with the mark are essentially, uh, I believe, basically marking themselves. Yes, I'm the temple because again, the, the bo their body, they're, 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 uh, they've given their body over to, to in the flesh to Satan. And so, um, what's interesting though is, and Jordan or maybe what do you guys know better than I do? Uh, the exact sequence of events, but I remember there's the passage of John, I think it was, where he says, um, uh, he spoke these things about the Holy Spirit that that he that was coming, but it wasn't coming until he had been ascended. So I'm wondering, like for example, the, uh, the Holy Spirit wasn't sealing believers uh, and uh, you know living in believers essentially uh, prior to his ascension, uh, and so. Given that when he comes back down to earth and physical body and we're all gen regenerated, um, you know, we will be perfectly righteous. I'm not sure if we'll still be sealed by the Holy Spirit at that point or not, you know. And so um, that would. Um, it, uh, I forgot what I was going with that. But it, again, I, the, the idea is that he's a, it's in a physical location and when uh, he, and he's also in, in believers. So when he comes back down to earth in, in the millennium, maybe the Holy Spirit will no longer be in believers we again, we will be born again of a new seed, perfectly righteous. Um, I don't know whether the Holy Spirit would, will still live us in it or not, but if it, if it's not, uh, that would again make sense that um, he's in believers while he's away. But when he comes back, he may no longer be in believers necessarily. And I say that because um, Satan may do the same thing essentially. Um, again, I'm thinking out loud. I should have shut up. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll think do this more clearly next no, time I, I think i see i see what you're saying and i think like the crux of whole the whole um what really debunks the whole thing is just the fact that you you pointed out um because he's claiming that you know why would why would the bible refer to this this you know fake show temple as the temple of god no it's clearly talking about believers and that like that that the antichrist will like mimic the holy spirit and and not only right. will it will it uh uh, declare itself God and, and the lost, which, by the way, if you look at the verse uh, as it would read, according to this guy's theory, I don't know if he realizes he's saying this, but that basically what, like that only believers <laughs> will be taken by the Antichrist? Like, is that what he's, because, because they, if the temple of God can only refer to the body of a believer, well, the verse never said anything about the Antichrist 
sitting in the body of you know unbelievers. Yeah, that. That's like, thank you, thank you. You always, you always get me. <laughs> no, that was Lisa. It. That was Lisa who actually pointed that out. Okay, talked, cool. But, but I, that, I that, that, that's where I was going exactly. So what I was saying was that um, you know some people, some people say uh, again. The reason I say I brought that up, I remember why I brought it up in the first place because some people say, oh, I don't think uh, there is going to be a temple that is actually going to be built because Satan's going to. Because just just as the Holy Spirit, um, the believers are the temple of, of God, the Holy Spirit. If if the Satan inhabits the uh, the uh, temple, then that must be a, an actual belief, a, actual people in, actually inhabiting them. And I think again, uh, the parallel I was trying to make it can be both. Essentially, he can actually be in because this one argue, the argument people use to say there's not going to be a Ezekiel's temple is that the temple that he's going to desecrate is. Uh, uh, the body of people, um, but again, that, I don't. It, we, first of all, that would say okay, you can't inhabit an unbeliever. Uh, I'm sorry, you can't inhabit a believer. So that wouldn't make any sense. And if he's an unbeliever, well, well that would be God's temple to begin with. So let me. Um, can I point something out real quick, just to show that that's what you're saying is absolutely probably the case because the devil is not omnipresent. And so what we know that the fallen ones, one of the names for the angels is the watchers, okay? And anybody who's ever dealt with anything dealing with spiritual warfare and how these entities operate know that they have what's called spying spirits, okay? Um, a, a fallen whatever, whether it's demons, whatever, that are assigned to people to watch them and they report back to the devil. So we can understand that concept. Why would it be any different that because the devil is not omnipresent, that he's going to come up with something that will possibly even allow, and I don't know if people consider this, that if they take the mark, that they will actually become, because they're not saved, demon-possessed. And, and in this way, they're connected, become the hive mind or whatever connected him. Doesn't mean just because that spirit enters them that then he can't then, as the man of sin, because we know he's going to receive a mortal wound and there will be actually a false resurrection because he's a he's a imitator. Satan will enter the man of sin at that point and he will literally bodily indwell him and then do that going into the temple and all that stuff. So uh, why why is it that it both can't happen? Why do they have to too. be mutually exclusive? Yeah, good, good point, Lisa, and 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 you sparked a thought in me too. Is that that very well could be the case because it makes sense because there's the Bible verses that say those who take the mark will seek death but not find it. And so if they're if they're possessed, you know, uh, that uh, by an entity that won't allow them to do what they want to do, essentially with their own body, uh, that would make sense why they couldn't. They would seek death but not be able to find it. Uh, I just think that's a possibility, something to think good about. Point. I always t sort of took it as like there would be a, a demonic possession, hive mind element, and I see it, I see it foreshadowed in all of uh, Satan's works in in Hollywood all the time, constantly over, over, over again. And I've seen it, I've seen how it works in real life too. It's like a hive mind. It's really like a hive mind, and um, so I, I take for granted like whatever other aspect of it, you know, there will be. A, to me, like that is definitely got to be a component because. Um, you know, I already feel that I've, I mean, I feel that I have witnessed people that are uh, possessed or at least the, a spirit jump, the same spirit jumping from person to person to person around me and speaking through them. Um, and mm -hmm. then, you know, there's all kinds of, uh, of examples of what really can only be explained as some type of hive mind, uh, spiritual hive mind, uh, you know, when people, there, there's all this inexplicable stuff we chalk up to conspiracy that it's like as a conscious human beings consciously doing these things um, conspiratorially. But I, I don't think it could be much more simple than that if they're lost because these spirits can, can work through them. And I do think that perhaps there's some hive mind aspect to demons in terms of like, they're, you know, they're all connected. Like they, they share information in real right. time. And mm -hmm. um, also we see in tons of, of depictions and like horror and stuff, which I think is always Satan dropping hints, right? Of, right. of like the, the sire of all the vampires, right? Being able to operate at will through any one of his uh, of his creatures at a given mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where he has ultimate control over them, whether he directly sired them or not. But like, if he was like the head vampire, the original vampire, he's got this thrall over all of his 
you know, the people that, that his create, you know, his, his uh, children have turned, you know? So I think that's really interesting, but I think that the idea that there's not a physical as well as a spiritual uh, temple, I mean, um, I guess this guy that I guess he just really believes that there's no significance whatsoever. I don't know if, what does he think? Like there's another temple that will be built like right then at the time that Christ returns. Like, like I, I don't, uh, I think that it's, it makes perfect sense that God would use the unbelieving Jews who don't realize that they're like working on behalf of Jesus to build his temple. They think they're building the temple to their Messiah, you know, uh, in accordance with the scriptures, of course, that's the thing, the temple Institute, though they are Christ hating and, you know, uh, Christ rejecting at the moment, they are meticulous and, and just absolute perfectionist in terms of how they're going about rebuilding this temple. And obviously, yeah, they would be, they would do that. I mean, they have all the details in scripture. They're probably want to get it right, but I see God's will at work there too. It's going to be done right. It's going to be the real temple. And they just don't realize you know, what they're doing right now, but they're actually, that's the, their thank you for building uh, the temple Jesus will reign from, right? It's so funny, uh, God's providence, but that's how he has to do everything. He has to work through imperfect and lost people to accomplish his will. What's interesting too, I've heard people say this before, I think there's very much something to it. You know, God uh, promised Abraham and David and uh, that they, that David's throne would exist forever. And it'd be an earthly kingdom, an earthly throne. And, um, and, uh, and so, you know, David had, had a physical throne he sat on and Christ is going to fulfill that on the earth, I believe. And what's interesting is that, um, people have made this, this assertion before, and I think there's something very much to it is that that whole dynamic between Saul in the old Testament and David is that Saul is a picture of Satan who's basically ruling, but it's not really his. He, it was not God, God did never gave it to him. He was he was ruling because the people chose him, but he was not God's man. David always was, and so D just as Saul sat on the throne uh, before David, um, again I think Antichrist is going to sit in that throne before Christ comes on and says, "I'm the rightful owner of this throne. I'm the rightful heir of the throne of David." Um, and so again, you see Saul as a, as the ruling authority, the god of this world, if you, if you will, but all the all the while. He's not really the, even though he he's operationally the, the god of this world, he's not the rightful heir of this world. It's ultimately Christ. He's going to come in and, and take his place, just like David. David had to uh, had to deal with Saul before he could uh, take to take his position on the throne. So, I see a parallel there again. That uh, absolutely, yeah. Yep. I get, we we gave Satan the reign. Okay. All right, guys, did you exhaust that point to where <laughs> enough? Did you have anything else you wanted to say on it? Uh, just in case we have any crossover viewers, like don't, don't, don't be deceived. And I think it's just what bothers me about it is not, I don't, I, I wish I would be glad if, if somebody has a channel as big as, as on point preparedness was being uh, was in, influenced by you know my little 2000 sub videos or or our live streams that I, I you know and where they would actually start spreading I believe accurate information that I don't think a whole lot of other people discuss that that's wonderful but what bothers me is when a deceiver will use the insights of of, of spirit-filled believers fellowshipping to take mm. credit for them and appear as though he's uh, coming up with all this stuff, block them so they can't actually ever talk to him on his channel to where people don't uh, ever, I don't, you know, I don't know, connect the dots or find out that it's not his, because he's like verbatim stealing stuff. And I don't care about that. Like, that would be great. But he uses it to then make, he looks really wise. And as if he's just this really insightful guy, it's lone voice in the wilderness with like 200,000 subs who's very insightful and in saying things that a lot of like most other larger channels are not saying. And then he comes and he uses these uh, crafty, cunning uh, and obviously bogus arguments to try to prove that we can lose our salvation through willfully sinning too much. That's his position. We can, that's a sin unto death is I guess when we willfully sin too often, like, you know, that that's the net. It's not even just whether we willfully sin ever at all or, you know, like once in a while, but like, I, I guess there's just some magic number of times is too much. And then you can lose salvation. That's his claim. But he comes off as very 
intelligent. I'm sure there's a whole lot of other people that he does this to. Um, but because I know it's strange he'll associate with a lot of like grace believing uh, uh, fellowship groups and stuff. And they have talked about how they have flatly refuted, you know, personally, directly one on one with him, like in a loving way, this idea of loss of salvation. And it doesn't even make sense that he could come away thinking that he's right and they're wrong. And he just kind of like hangs around. It's almost like he's like doing reconnaissance <laughs> or something and then goes on and just keeps preaching this false gospel as if he's just impenetrable. But it, it, it's weird how he, if, if he thinks that we're so wrong about the gospel and we're, we're preaching this, which if you could lose your salvation, I mean, we're, we're we'd be totally irresponsible. We'd be murderers spiritually for, for what mm-hmm. we're teaching. And yet he's willing to, listen to our our broadcasts and even verbatim like <laughs> verbatim rip off the stuff we say you know mm. to me it just seems like it's just frustrating because of the fact that he won't well if you respect us enough to listen to us why don't you respect us enough to hear us out on what the gospel is or at least discuss it with us at all you know um and it, it's it's really frustrating when people can cloak themselves in uh, the the insights or uh, wisdom of others and you know or the, the holy spirit and then use that to come against the true gospel and i do think this was a a, a clever and maybe a very original uh little attempt at uh trying to uh come against the true gospel because i've never heard anybody else use it but if you just if you if he only briefly touches on it it sounds i mean i'm sure a lot of the people that watch him especially uh it sounds like wait you're right i was right there the whole time we never thought of it because mm-hmm. they're 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 assuming the premise that the temple has to be the, the and can only be the body of a believer and that there's no other context uh, and they don't think about that part they just it just hits them in the gut and they're just like well they, that settles it and that's just so uh, sinister to me so hopefully uh, hopefully we can make a dent somehow I <laughs> hopefully that guy, I don't know if he's gonna go into it further but man. That's a that's a sinister little uh, little trick the devil pulled uh, when, when it was just the last like couple minutes of the show too of uh, hour long stream that he mentioned this offhandedly you know I don't I'm I think surprised he flesh his argument out better anyway I think that's why it was so brief oh I I was gonna say I'm surprised you haven't made a video like with his name in the title calling him out. <laughs> Because I don't want to be like one of those people that sounds like, oh, really? Yeah, I'm sure this guy with like hundreds of thousands of subs is watching your channel. But he he subscribed to me. I I know it happened. I got the notification, and I used to talk to him. But he, I never, we never argued. And then he he, I just found out I was blocked in his chat. Like right, because I came into his channel right after I saw that he subbed to me. I was in his mm-hmm. chat. I was trying to say something, and I was blocked. I was like, that's really weird. But then. <laughs> But then, and anybody who watches the show a lot, if you actually go and look at his videos, especially on his Rumble, you will hear the same arguments I have made that probably not a lot of other people make about my little theories about what's going on right now with the world and the little uh, con Satan's pulling with this whole left-right thing. Uh, not not a common perspective and verbatim stuff that like anecdotes ways of explaining it ways of like justifying it he does a really good job though because he puts clips and video examples and you will know for sure there is no doubt that it is not a coincidence that ben went on a whole spiel about spiritual nakedness that it's like i've never Mm -hmm. heard anybody else talk about it the way he did in the detail he did from the perspective that he had and Mm -hmm. then the very like that within a week this guy does his weekly video on spiritual nakedness and it's it's ridiculous. Like it was, it was absolutely been what Ben was saying, but just, you know, not as, not as thoughtful or, or accurate, but I mean, it, he didn't just happen to think of this, especially, you know, what's not a, a Holy spirit download. He doesn't even believe the true gospel. Right. So that's frustrating. I should make a video at least addressing maybe like a, a, an individual standalone video, this whole idea of like the temple of God, the antichrist and, you know, oh, that proves <laughs> that you can lose your salvation. I think, uh, especially if he goes into it further, I will do that. But no, I'm not going to be one of those butthurt people that's like, he's ripping me off, guys. It's not fair. Because I'd really be glad for it. And I wanted I wanted a big channel to not really rip me off, but just basically see that I, that maybe I had a better ex- explanation of some of the, the tricks the media is playing right now than the common just like, oh, the left are taking over the world and everybody's going to fall for it and everybody's going to be a leftist when everybody's just getting increasingly disgusted with this insanity. We're not even, we gender is 
not even, we can't discern it. Like there's no agreed upon way to discern gender at birth. Like that's not supposed to convince you. It's it's supposed to make everybody just like snap. Be like, enough, these people need to be like exterminated or I really think that's the point. And I don't hear a lot of people saying that. And that's what he started talking about constantly after he subscribed to me, which I was happy about. But I'm not happy when somebody hates our, hates the true gospel mm-hmm. and will will poach you know insight from people who actually believe the true gospel. And then that, wouldn't you think he would want to discuss it with me or Ben if he thought it was so influential that he would make, you know rip off so much content? Wouldn't you think like a normal person would be like with like normal intentions would, would want to reconsider it or debate it? Like if you see if there's something you really respect or or um, are influenced by, you could talk to them. Wouldn't you want to hash it out? But no, he just wants to block and not even not even address it. And he is um, very popular and he sounds very wise. And you wouldn't know he didn't believe the true gospel unless mm-hmm. he saw one of his few his few videos where he. Uh, goes into detail because he's very sneaky about like they all I mean the most of them are very sneaky the lordship salvation type they're sneaky about what they really believe and they they say it's grace um and by by faith alone right up until the point where you ask if you can lose salvation which they rarely address you know a a lot of them I think they rarely address it because they don't want to they want to you know uh go unnoticed they want people to think or assume that they're saved you know well i so. wasn't suggesting that you should do a butt hurt video <laughs> yeah <laughs> i just i was suggesting more like a call out challenge type video mm-hmm. uh to allow you to unblock you and allow you to be able to make comments uh because you feel that he he swiped uh you know content especially and, Vince. that's undeniable yeah, no, that's what i'm saying and yeah. then, you know, and call him out about it. Not not even just doing butt hurt. Just like, it, why don't you let me or even at, have him ha, at, challenge him to have you on to speak about, you know, what what you're concerned about that you saw him do, that you're aware he did. So I guess I think I would be giving him a heads up to just um, preemptively dismiss me as crazy and someone he's never heard of. Because uh, I have no proof that he subscribed to me. And I don't really want to do all that. I, I So much as like, I just want him to know I know. <laughs> and that Ben knows. I just want that to happen, and uh, maybe eventually, then just actually make videos addressing the you know BS that he is teaching that doesn't come from our mouth. You know the stuff about you know obviously loss of salvation and this new thing where with the uh, with the temple and all that. I think that that would probably. Be well, you know what's about. interesting too. I just thought of this. There's a verse in First uh, John five. It says, "We know that whoever is born of God does not sin." But he who has been born of God keeps himself, <coughs> excuse me, and the wicked one does not touch him. So, again, we don't believe your sin. What he's referring to there is the new, I believe, the new man, the the new inner man. He cannot sin. You uh, you cannot ever say, again, that's the whole refutation of First John, by the way. He's refuting Gnostics who teach that good and evil can coexist and that God, there's darkness and lightness in God and things like that. So, right. John uses these stark terms uh, to 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 refute that. And he says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin again, not as, as an expression of our new nature, but he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. So uh, again, how can a, a be, believer be demon possessed in that case? Uh, and also in Thessalonians, it says um, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So uh, it's God would allow it's, it's obvious that God would have to allow a believer to be demon possessed. And why on earth would he ever do that? It's like, mm-hmm. like Jordan said, he, we're not ours anymore. He, he, we're bought at a price and, and God's not going to buy you to have you st- stolen again. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. We talked about that though. Couple, last couple of weeks. All oh, right. Oh, I, I, yeah, think I, don't we wore, I don't even know. Yeah. Oh, I think God. we wore that out. I, yes. I think we definitively, yeah, uh, we did. slam dunk that you a believer cannot be possessed from the inside there's no way and, and we talked about that and i know people disagree with us and we understand that you disagree with us but if you look at the scriptures in context carefully what you're actually saying is that then jesus did not preserve us and we are not his purchased possession and we are not preserved 
and that he can't keep us. You've got to understand that if you say that a Christian can be, I'm talking about Bible believing, blood bought, blood washed, no weirdness, no false Christianity, the real dealio can be possessed from the inside, then God is a liar. And his power is not greater. Right. So, uh, anybody else? Uh, Jordan, you've been quiet for a while. Did you fall asleep? No, I've been trying to blend into the background because eschatology is my Achilles heel. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I'm not very I'm good at it either. <laughs> I, I don't even try. I just, I've been wrong so many times. I just give up. <laughs> <laughs> God knows, I don't even care. I don't have no horse in the race, but uh, me face is not too hard. But I know how you feel, Jordan. I just have no. Good <laughs> not gonna oh, be no, wrong that's again. Why. Dang it. <laughs> oh no, that's wise. If you don't know a lot about a subject, it's okay to say, "Hey, I, I'm not that familiar with it," and not and not speak on it. So uh, until you learn more, that's that's a wise thing to do. I don't have a problem with that. Well, I just, I just feel make sure like. Yeah, I just feel like eschatology, like, if yeah, so asleep. many of us can't even get the gospel right when it, it's that simple, I know that we're not going to be able to get eschatology right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's almost like, yeah, you made it really hard to get eschatology right, too. I almost <laughs> I almost think we're all going to be wrong. So, like, really wrong. Like, it's just like, we just don't even know. We know, like, certain important things that we need to know, but... This seems like no one has it exactly figured out. However, I do feel like, you know, I'm I'm slowly starting to kind of piece it together. But for a long time, like the idea of a, a literal millennial reign, I didn't know Christians believed that as an unbeliever. Yeah, I didn't know that, that was part of the deal. And it totally freaked me out so much to find out. I was like, I just <laughs> never, I didn't know. I don't know how I feel about this. I, even though I didn't feel like I thought that there was proof in scripture that it wasn't literal. I just was like, I can't imagine that. I don't want to rule. I don't want to rule anybody. I don't want to reign this is all weird. I thought we just went to heaven and it was all better after that. And I didn't know there was this intermediate step and I'm just not ready to deal with it yet. Cause it, it, cause I, I whole life whole, like until 30 didn't know that it was part of the part of the story or even possibly I'm glad you didn't either. My family never told me about that. Jordan. <laughs> it's a weird thing to cut to realize. They also didn't talk about our rapture or non rapture. Like mm -hmm. it, well, I was, I didn't know that that was a thing either. Yeah, uh, and you're still on the movie. fence about that, right, Angel? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't have any uh, animosity or anything toward either of you. I, I tend to, I respect a lot of people who do believe in the rapture. I would say, like, most of the people that I respect most as believers believe in a literal rapture. And I used to be, like, really against the idea because, again, it just weirds me out, and I'm a control freak, and that freaks me out. <laughs> so, like, my flesh, I don't want it to be true because it just scares me. And what will happen to my cats and all of that we've talked about before. <laughs> so I am just like, but 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 I, I I will defer to the believers I respect the most, who I've talked about it the most. But you know, right now, like I lean toward it just because I don't it's not my ego's my ego is not involved at all. My like O C D control freak stuff is <laughs> isn't involved at all. Like I'm not like eager for it because I'm it stresses me out as a mom with a bunch of little kids and animals. Like it just uh okay, it just so freaks me out. They could stack you up at any minute. Are you like OCD or or because I know people, I just want to clarify which one you are. Are you OCD or are you OOCCDD? You're double. Okay, double. Yeah. OO, obsessive, obsessive, compulsive, compulsive, disorder, disorder. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I definitely not the type where I'm very neat and tight. I'm not that type. Just like, just uh, compulsive, like, control issues. Okay. Uh, and, yeah, that type of thing. Specific category <laughs> yeah. for you. What about you, Jordan? I, so my OCD is, like, it's definitely not the neat and tidy thing. Like I said, I've lost so many things just within this podcast. But <laughs> my OCD is very weird. Like, it's definitely, like, a controlling OCD, too. But it's almost like a, a it's like a nagging. If I don't know something or if something's not all the way clear I just I won't be able to sleep I won't be able to stop thinking about it it's just oh uh, it's so Savior. Savior. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to ask you man <laughs> where would you fit on that scale well it's only on things I really want to if I want to know something 
uh, or try to understand something. Like a lot of times, I'll, I'll be writing a, uh, like a some kind of pro. So I'll be coding, and I couldn't figure it out or whatever. And uh, I'll keep on thinking about it until I solve it, even in my dreams. Um, and, and then a lot of times, I'll wake up with the answer. And same with the Bible too. Um, and I mentioned this earlier. You know, I, I the I, I see the Bible as really a code for your soul. And so you, every time you read it and digest it and grow from it, you're upgrading your operating system, essentially your, your soul operating system. And, uh, you, 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 I take it in and you might not always process it all, but you take it in. And I think in the right time, God uses the Holy spirit to bring it to your remembrance and connect dots and things like that. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I just like, I can't, I'm always thinking about the Bible until I can get an answer. And I, I was saying with eschatology, I was really clueless about it for a long time. I think I'm starting to get a, a clearer picture where it doesn't conflict or it makes sense. It harmonizes. It's a coherent. I'm not saying I've got it all figured out, but I think I'm starting to get better at it. Um, and so uh, that's, that's how cop kind of OCD as well. All right. Okay. Well, I don't have any such disorder, so I, I can't feel your pain, but <laughs> I just, um, you know, you're not going to not even try to refute me on that and <laughs> accuse me of not being honest here. I was just wondering. <laughs> okay. You, all right. No problem. <laughs> you, th you think you've got, it, you've got it together, Lisa. You've got it all together. Okay. Thank you. You're I'm a role so model. Glad I was wondering if anybody was going to ever recognize that. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I think we all have some things that we have to, you know, that's one of the things that we end up having to do is when we start sliding too far one way or the other, you know, what I call it, you know, being on tilt, we have to uh, get rerouted, regrounded and bring ourselves back to the promises of God. So we don't go into fear. We don't go, you know, too far into obsessing about things. That's why the Bible is our anchor, the word of God in all matters of faith and practice. And we have to sort of like recenter ourselves on the focus of Christ whenever we start veering too much because the flesh is fallen and it's very easy to do any of that and be obsessed, obsess about anything, you know? So I want to thank you guys. I want to Thank my wonderful guest, Jordan, Revivalist for Christ. If you guys have not subbed to his channel or at least went and checked it out, please do so. He's got some wonderful content. He does fabulous interviews uh, with, with people. I, I really enjoyed the last one I just saw, and I'm looking forward to the one you have coming up this coming Thursday. Jordan, would you like to take the time to tell us about that? Oh, sure. Um, I'm doing a collab with Christian Convos. Um, he's another YouTube channel. I'm really excited for Ben's whenever we do his. I'm super excited for that one. And I really want to have Angel on too. P.S. Angel, I emailed you this week. <laughs> I finally remember. Uh, and I, like you lose things, I forget to do things like check email unless no, a notification like, just... like smacks me in the face and and my phone is not cooperating on that end lately. So no, I, it was I now, just yesterday, I think. Yeah, oh, good. Was... Oh, I feel okay. Normally, <laughs> normally I people like catch me in like multiple days of not checking, so that's good. I didn't have to tell them myself. And, but yes, I would love to, and I hope that like people are prepared for probably like a six-hour uh, discussion that's going to be embarrassing afterwards because we talk too much. But I it'll be fun. <laughs> it will be so much fun. Yeah. yeah. But, so that comes out on Thursday at three o'clock p.m. Eastern. So, uh, but of course, you guys can tune in whenever. I, yes, I gotta go check that out too. I'm gonna <laughs> check out your channel. I forgot that too. So I'm gonna do it right now. I'm, I'm gonna like sub right now, so I don't because oh, I will forget again. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, okay, I'm well, it. it's not my fault. I, I'm there. <laughs> Oh wow, she's already blaming the baby for stuff, and the baby's not it's even the here. Baby. My <laughs> IQ has dropped like fifteen points every time. It's bad. It's really bad. I don't have. I have like so many missing earbuds. I have one pair of earbuds I'm supposed to take back because they suck skull candy. 
$50 skull candy. They are terrible. They're the worst ones ever. And I lost one of those because I, I forgot to take them back for two weeks and I kept using them and now I've lost one. I can't take it back. That's how bad, that's how bad I am. And that's just one of three pairs where I'm missing one. <laughs> so I know how you feel for it. I've lost <laughs> many things during this uh, I, podcast as well. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, okay, cool. It, you, you threw me either. I wasn't expecting that. I, I wasn't expecting for you to blame the baby already. That one threw me. So. <laughs> oh, they, they will happen many more times. Many okay, more cool. Times. No problem. And then Ben, uh, what would you like to say in closing brother? I know, uh, you're, you're, you've agreed already tentatively to, uh, appearing on Jordan's yes. podcast. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, I got to get Woo! my popcorn ready for that one. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be listening. And Angel, too. I'm taking notes. And anything I find out that you guys have been holding from me, I'm going to I'm gonna challenge you on it when I get back. Any weird <laughs> beliefs or anything like that, I'm, we're going to question you about. No, I'm just kidding. When we come back here on the panel. Um, let's see. Did I go to everybody? Jordan said goodnight. Ben. Ben, you didn't get to say goodnight. I kind of interrupted you there unless you'd be able oh, to Oh, well, goodnight. no, it's, it was a great discussion tonight. I, I really liked the the topics. Um, and Jordan, I, I really I just love – I love your channel. I love, I love the format that you have of oh interviewing goodness, those people. All these compliments. <laughs> no, you're really good. You're you're a, you're a real tour de you're force. I mean, yes, oh you're gosh. a real blessing. That's what Ben Absolutely. said the first time that he said he was sent directly by God exactly. Oh, my at gosh. At the very moment. It's, it's awesome. So, yes. like he's one of us. Oh, I yes. love you Did guys you, so much. I'm gonna cry. You, oh, <laughs> Did you see God. his promo for this broadcast? I just subscribed just now, so I will. <laughs> Man, I, I, it was he does promos. Wow, yes. It was <laughs> fire too. It was fire hot. I was like, oh, he's like kicking sacred fake Christian cows. Yeah, that was awesome. That was a really great one. It was, was good. Angel, you have yeah. to see it. You're gonna be in stitches. Um, as soon as we're done, I'm going to, I'm going to to that because I've subscribed now, and there's very little to watch on YouTube these days. At least for me, it's like a desert. So I'm excited. <laughs> Okay, and then I would like you to go ahead and say goodnight and and tell people about your channel and uh, whatever else you have to say in closing this evening. Angel? Sorry, when, sorry, I was plugging my phone in before it died. Oh, because okay. That, that I thought the I thought the baby reached up and grabbed your vocal cords. <laughs> no, it killed my phone's battery, you know. Um, but uh, no, I and always you know that this always happens like within like five or ten minutes after broadcast ends, I just cut out. Because my phone mm -hmm. died and I have forgotten the whole time. Because <laughs> I guess the, the Bluetooth or eats the battery up or something. But uh, this time I caught it in time. But yes, it this I I haven't even fully processed how amazing this particular show has been, especially with the two miracles that happened while we were live. I I mean it's like that <laughs> totally hit me yet, but I I was in tears at one point and I don't like even pregnant I don't tear up easily like that usually except it's like I catch a movie or something and it sometimes I'll be really embarrassed about what stuff that'll make me cry <laughs> especially when I'm pregnant but this was this was not that like it uh normally normally when something's really intense I like am in shock for a minute and but by the second time we got this incredible announcement within 30 minutes uh, at the very, very beginning of Resurrection Morning, <laughs> we had these two uh, uh, miracles, they, they, these um, the two new additions to the to the body of Christ, and they actually uh, <laughs> announced it in our chat. And you know, God used us. <laughs> you know, me. I you knew how messy my house is right now. It's like, Christ, <laughs> what is it? God, you are just. <laughs> it's all glory to Him. You know that that. <sighs> Because nothing that we're saying is not about exalting ourselves at all. We're saying that we are so um, wretched and imperfect that we know it can't have anything to do with us whatsoever. But people actually accuse you of being prideful for believing that you're sealed and saved eternally. Like, no take backs. They'll think that that's prideful. And it's like, because I don't think that my salvation could have anything to do with, uh, like, my uh, dysfunctional... Uh, uh, well, I, I was going to say a different word. My dysfunctional butt that I, I don't think that I could have ever <laughs> even had anything to do with earning even the tiniest little bit of my salvation. No, it's 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 uh, 
it's that's the beauty of it. God gives us that freedom from like there's the, the where we don't have to claim any have any pride or ego in our salvation. And I don't think it's because God is an egomaniac that he retains all the glory for himself and for Jesus Christ. You know, there were plenty of opportunities for Jesus to try to impress people and, and glorify himself. And we know that, that he always took a humble route um, and a, and a subtle route in all that he did uh, because it was a perfect balance to the fact that he is, you know, uh, (laughs) the word eternal and that God is, the God of all creation. It's just this perfect, like God gave us the person of Jesus to show us the, that even though he doesn't this have to be humble at all, because he wants us to understand the importance of humility and respect. That is how uh, Jesus presented himself um, to us. And uh, that he, he demonstrated the, the character of God, that God is not an egomaniacal a tyrant who just uh, demands worship for his own, for his, the sake of his own ego. He does so because we should be just like, we should be thankful and grateful to our parents, no matter how messed up they are. Like he, he has asked us to honor them. It's for our own sake because we'd be jerks if we didn't. That's the same thing with when it comes to uh, giving all the glory to God, because it's because he, he care he wants our character developed and it's important for us to let go of our, our vain glory, our, our pride, our ego, um, especially when it comes to something as crucial as uh, our eternal state. So I just love that because, you know, <laughs> we joke and we're, we don't have, I don't believe we come in a spirit of false piety on this show. And um, uh, <laughs> a lot of people are a lot more high minded about what, you know, their, uh, th- what they call, you know, their ministry and, and they're very, <laughs> they're very serious. And I love that the fact that we just get on here and we just speak openly um, and, and, and honestly about what, you know, what we think in our takes on things. And then we could have these, um, blessings happen. And it's just on, on resurrection morning too. I, ever, I think, I think like within the first hour or over the first two hours is, is when both of, uh, both Jim, um, and the other, uh, uh newborn baby in Christ, uh, came into the chat. I, I don't think it was prior to midnight that we, that we heard that we heard the first uh, the first announcement that they were ready to come to come to faith. So I think that's just really interesting because I never I didn't even think about that until Jordan said something. Uh, and it's just beautiful. What a beautiful gift, especially when we know that Easter gets uh, commandeered with like this awful pagan blood ritual. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a nice reminder. Yeah. <laughs> it's really gross if you look into where it came from. it's horrible it's just yeah. it, i i don't even feel like god would care if i let my girls go on an easter egg hunt but because i know what where that the eggs come from and what they used to do i just can't, i just can't i just feel wrong about <laughs> doing it it's not because i think we'd get in trouble it's just gross it's such an mm-hmm. ugly thing so this is just a beautiful reminder of the real reason yeah. for the for the season yeah that's right well I wanted to say thank you personally to each one of my friends here tonight. I want to thank you, Jordan, for agreeing to come on. We're definitely going to have you back to continue talking about this um, weirdness that was going on in the 1800s. And Jordan and I were just talking about this during a phone conversation one night. I was coming at it from a secular angle about a lot of the different changes they started making Uh, There was a controversy about some things concerning dictionaries that linguistic purists were pointing out. They were changing things and changing the meanings, the true meaning and origins and etymologies and things of words around that time, as well as laws. Uh, There are those that argue that, for example, the American Constitution was actually suspended in 1871 uh, and that we've been operating under uh, some weird admiralty and other things. Uh, there are uh, the medical profession, for example, switched from naturopathic medicine to allopathic medicine, which was when they switched from using things like herbs and natural remedies and treatments that had been proven uh, that did no harm to patients to things of, of a chemical nature from the petrochemicals uh, which then became the pharmaceutical industry. Um, A lot of different changes started happening 
in the 1800s. And he, he came at it from the religious aspect of these weird cults that ar arose at the same time period. So uh, we're going to have uh, more discussions on that because um, this is one of the signs of the the spirit of the age is that the the man of sin would change times and laws and it are and, and it started way even before that but it just seemed like it is just was on wildfire on tilt and, and erupted at, at breakneck speed uh in the 1800s in preparation for the different uh ages that were to come like the industrial age and then of course we had world war one world war two and and different things that transpired to bring us to where we are today in preparation for the man of sin. And I think it, it, as we begin to put this together, you guys are going to start to see a picture that this is this is not an accident. And as you've heard that term, like the hidden hand behind things, uh, we can see that the God of this world is making all of these things that they're doing, they come to uh, fruition because he's he's only got but a short time his time is almost up we know that before uh the king of kings and the lord of lords breaks through the clouds which is where we go from genesis to the book of the revelation of jesus christ and you know i tell a little joke tongue in cheek that jesus is going to break forth and go lucy you got some explaining to do so you know <laughs> that's a nickname for satan by the way <laughs> But okay. Good point. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and then and then don't be discouraged, beloved. As you see the darkness being unveiled, I, I don't believe that it's rising. I think it's being revealed that it was always there. It was just hidden, and the light of Christ shines brightest in the darkness. So be encouraged. Praise the Lord. Uh, thank you all for making it to the end of the broadcast again. Uh, on this now April 4th, 2021. Uh, happy Resurrection Sunday to everyone out on the East Coast and Midwest and now West Coast. It is Resurrection Sunday. This is the day that our Lord was raised from the dead over 2,000 years ago. The Bible says he was raised on the first day of the week. And just pointing out, uh, Pentecost also happened 50 days later on the first day of the week, he was showing he was doing a new thing with the church. So on that note, uh, Ben is going to play something for us uh, where Jordan, I love this video, and, and I had put up a, a um, thumbnail for it, which is love is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to play what Brother Jordan had created. I love it. It's just one of my favorite explanations. And he's going to play that on the way out tonight. I hope you'll stick around and watch it if you have not seen it. Be blessed, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Good night and good morning. This is the gospel message, and I just pray that you will open your heart and let it change your life. We were fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God to declare his glory and reveal his majesty. The problem is that one of the angels of God wanted to be higher than God himself and therefore this angel was cast out of heaven, becoming the fallen angel, or as we know him, the devil. One day in the Garden of Eden, there was Adam and Eve, the first humans and the fallen angel appeared to them in the form of a serpent and tempted them to sin against God, and they did, causing mankind to fall. God was angered and he casted Adam and Eve from the garden and told the serpent that he was going to send one who would crush the serpent's head and the serpent would bruise his heel. You have to understand that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and because of that, we all deserve an eternal separation from God, which is hell. But God loved the world so much that he became man, and that man's name was Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life by fulfilling all the requirements of the law in order to become the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He was spat on, mocked, and beaten, and people even gambled over his clothes. He was whipped to the point where his flesh was torn from his body and a crown of thorns was crushed into his skull. 
He was then forced to carry his cross to the site where he would be nailed to it. Jesus then used his last bit of energy after hanging on the cross for several hours to say, It is finished. And then he commended his spirit to the Father. Jesus was then buried. But three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering sin and death. Don't you see? God passed the law that would cause the Jews to sentence his incarnate form to death. The law was the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ and allow us to see our need for a savior. The law was a shadow of good things to come. The promise came before the law. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This is our savior. Now, whosoever believes in Jesus Christ as your savior by trusting in his life, death, burial, and resurrection will be saved. He will take on your sin and you will take on his imputed righteousness. This is the love of God that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Call out to him today. Confess him as your Lord. When you trust only in the blood of Jesus Christ to be your salvation from sin, you will be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise as a down payment of guarantee of eternal life until the day of deliverance. The Holy Spirit is the seed of God which is planted in you by Jesus Christ through faith in Him. This is what allows you to be presented before a holy God as blameless. The Holy Spirit then baptizes you into the body of Christ, making you part of the ecclesia, meaning the church or the called out ones. Your heart will be circumcised and you will be sanctified, meaning you will be set apart from your flesh. We are eternally secure in him because he who begins a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. And daily we will work out our salvation with reverent fear and rejoice and trembling as we conform to the image of Jesus Christ. We become disciples of Jesus and that discipleship journey will look different for everyone. So do not compare yourself to other Christians, but only to Jesus Christ because he is the only standard we strive for. Repent today, that is to turn towards Jesus. Do not let man deceive you into thinking that you must drop all your sins before you come to Jesus. Jesus wants you to come just as you are because he came to call the sinners to repentance, not the righteous. Those who are given to him by God and seek him, he shall in no way cast out. Stop clinging on to the branches of religion and instead come to know the true vine, that is Jesus Christ, because without him, there is no victory, there is no deliverance, and there is no healing. We can do nothing without him. He is our savior from the penalty of sin. He is our savior from the power of sin. And eventually he will be our savior from the presence of sin. He himself took on the penalty of sin your sin, that you would find forgiveness and redemption from your sin today. He desires a relationship with you, and heaven is waiting to rejoice when you turn to him. Receive the free gift of salvation today through faith in Jesus Christ, and enter through the narrow gate that leads to eternal life with your heavenly Father. Amen.